escuchar esta reunión en español. Gracias. All right, we're going to call this meeting to order. Um, Dr. Joyner, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance since you weren't here last week? <laughs> You're muted, Dr. Joyner. He's muted. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the. I, I was on mute. Was on the oh, okay, go ahead. You want to go ahead? Dr. Joyner, did you want me to continue or? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item on the agenda is public participation. Dr. Joyner and Dr. White. Dr. Joyner, are you ready? Uh, I just did the pledge. Did I make a mistake? Oh, no. Now I walk to public comment now. Are you ready to keep time? Oh, yeah. Let me get my timer. Okay, let me clear okay. this. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Our first speaker this evening is Teresa Johnson. Ms. Johnson, you may speak. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So first I'd like to thank you all for um, acknowledging and answering the questions that came from the last meeting and also for honoring the public request to increase the speaking time. Um, so maybe I won't have an asthma attack after this meeting. Um, <laughs> but I do still have a couple of questions. Um, and I do appreciate the responses. Like I said, it, I think it gives us an opportunity to have um, some conversations and some dialogues. So my first question um, last week was about Dr. Tracy's um, residency. And I've seen that from the response that it will be up, I guess, to the mayor and the board to confirm her residency and maybe even confirm her electoral. Um, so is that going to happen? Uh, because we know that all other superintendents were required to live in New Haven as well as other city leaders. Um, secondly, I think last meeting, um, recording, recording. Tracy said that um, nurses was a courtesy. That is uh, news to me. Nurses have been in school since I was in school and I'm 53 years old. Um, and if it was a courtesy, why now in the heat of a pandemic would we decide that we don't wanna extend that courtesy anymore? Um, and then with the after school programs, um, she said that the money was for the ESSER grants was for summer programs and not after school programs. And I'm very uh, concerned and would like to know, did we really spend $31 million on those summer programs that we just had? Um, and why wouldn't there be funds left over mm -hmm. for after school programs? And why couldn't they be used as the same type of um, set up that the summer programs were. And who's answering these questions on the, um, in the minutes? And that's all my questions for tonight. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kirsten Hopes McFadden. Ms. McFadden, you may speak. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. You couldn't hear me last time. Hi. Um, good evening, everyone. I just have a couple questions. Um, um, in light of the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine being approved um, by the FDA today, is there going to be a mandate? I know it said that in the um, in the answer to my question that, that the vaccine will be mandated, but I've never really heard the board say that. Is it going to be mandated that all staff employees receive the vaccine um, and not just be willing to be tested. Um, and if that's not going to be mandated, is there going to be mandatory testing, uh, weekly testing, not you just sign up if you want to, um, but it's going to be a mandate that you have to go 
and be tested or you have to get the vaccine. Also, is there going to be a mandate for children 12 and over to be vaccinated as well? And I do have um, a similar concern to Ms. Johnson with regard to nurses, saying nursing, having nurses is a courtesy. Um, I never knew that having nurses in the building was a courtesy. Um, I thought it was something that we provided. And who is going to be making sure that everybody's okay, not just for COVID, because COVID is a big issue, but we also have other issues in the building. Um, and if we, we don't have a nurse in the building, how is this going to be safe? I'm really concerned because now we're going back full in person five days a week. It's not hybrid anymore. It's everybody's in there. So we need nurses even more so now because if children are, and parents send their children to school. I mean, I, I mean, you know, you do what you do. You think the kid is okay. And you send the kid to school. So it's a few sniffles, but it might be something more, um, you know, where are these children going to be located in the building? Um, and I'm really concerned because, you know, we're supposed to keep seating charts. And I've never had a seating chart in my class ever. I mean, I let my kids sit wherever they want to sit. And I don't like the responsibility of having, um, you know, that put on me that I, I have to have this strict seating chart in order for you to do contact tracing especially if the, the district isn't doing their part by providing nurses and providing, you know, that part of it and making sure that everybody is vaccinated. Um, at this point, I think that's all the questions I have tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Glover. Oh, they put their hand down and it made me click on someone else. So I will take them out. Uh, Rachel Glover. Okay. She's using an outmoded version of Zoom, going to have to pull her on off briefly. Should I start the, uh, I started the timing. What, what are we gonna do next? I, if you could restart it, cause we had to switch to a mode that she could get on. Okay. Hi, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm using an older uh, computer. Um, I just had um, some questions regarding all day pre-K and before school programming, um, kind of piggybacks on some of the other questions that were asked earlier. But um, my main concern is that the all day pre-K was cut right basically during the pandemic. And a lot of parents... Jack, no, thank you. A lot of parents were unaware that that had even really went on. We thought it was probably going to be a temporary thing. We were so swamped with like dealing with the remote and making sure our kids were doing what they needed to do, making sure one parent was home, making all the ad adaptations that it was just a shock to us, basically, that this is happening now. Now parents, for the most part, need to return to work and um, we need these programs. It's, you know, we have money that has come in to the budget in New Haven, certainly. And, you know, before we're adding things on to the budget, I would really like to see that the programming that we had lost that got cut get restored. Um, and I just think it's really going to be detrimental also to children because the effects of this basically are parents need to get to work and we need to make a livelihood for our kids to support them, then what's gonna happen is these older kids, 10, nine years old, are gonna end up being left home and they're gonna end up having to get themselves to school on their own and possibly looking after younger children. So I think it's potentially gonna be a dangerous thing for those kids um, <laughs> to not have these programs. The funding was also earmarked for um, basically any program that offers social, emotional, well-being to these children. When you look at the CSD website, as a matter of fact, it does say that, you know, that you can use this, these funds for after-school programming, for any out-of-school programming that basically offers social and emotional well-being. So I'd really like to see this, you know, considered. And also, if you look at your websites, if you go to your magnet websites right now, and I'm, I'll, I'll send you a link in chat, but basically it still says that you're offering all day pre-K. So parents are really misinformed 
as far as this goes, we're feeling really blindsided by it. If you go to the school websites on a lot of them in a magnet, it still says, you know, before and after school programming and that it's offered. So I just, I really hope that you can consider finding, you know, money in the budget to, you know, offer this programming again. It's a huge consideration for parents also when we chose to live in New Haven, chose to purchase homes in New Haven, that this programming was offered. And I really thank you for your time. I will um, also put my um, information in chat so that you can consider it and look at it. Thank you so much. At this time, there are no more raised hands. Thank you, Dr. White and Dr. Joyner. Um, so before we continue, I just I'm, I want to I'm going to move up the um, president's report to after. after the um, actually so the action items so I'll just go into my president's report now before the action items just because part of what I want to uh, mention has to do with um, one of the items so there was an email um, I think this morning or yesterday regarding items that documents that were thought to be, should have been posted on the website and were not. Um, the MOU being one of them, I just wanna clarify that we have someone kind of covering for the persons who normally um, post the documents to the website and get it out to the board members. The MOU was posted to the website this morning um, for my request. I also requested that the resumes be um, emailed to the board member who questioned not having them because he wasn't here to receive the, the physical packet. And so that should have been emailed at this point. However, they have not been uploaded to the website. Um, there's a question about whether or not they should be uploaded to the website given the information that's on them. And so I've requested um, an opinion from Shipman and Goodwin, and I'm awaiting the response. So I will share that response, or they may email it to the entire board, whatever that response is going to be. Um, but just wanted to give a little information on that before we got started. Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Madam President. I'm the one who sent that, um, that um, email to you um, and the rest of the board. Um, I've been complaining at several meetings that we're not getting um, reports before the meeting, that we're getting information at the meeting, sometimes not physically, but just through a, a web, um, web, uh, webinar so that we don't get a chance to read it, review it, the whole bit. Um, the information that I requested is public information. Um, if, I, if, I had, if I asked for an FOI, I would be within my rights to get it or any other person. Uh, and because it's public information and because we are reviewing it to make our decisions, then the public should have that information also. I don't understand why um, that is such a difficult thing to do, um, particularly around public employees. They are public employees and the public has the right to know who they are, where they live, how much money they're going to make when it comes to public money. Um, so sending us a redatted resume um, goes outside of, of what we're allowed to have um, as, public, um, as public officials and as a public person. Any person can request that information. And why, why go through that process of forcing people to do FOIs in, the, in the, the whole bit? And if we're gonna have the information sitting in front of us, I want the public to know what, how we're, what, what information we're making our decisions um, off of. Um, so I, I hope that again, this doesn't happen. It keeps happening every week. And I decide every meeting, which for me, it seems like it's almost every meeting 
And for me, I've decided enough is enough. I raise it at every meeting where it happens. Um, and I will not, I will in protest, not vote on those items that were, weren't made public um, before this meeting. Thank you, Madam President. Okay, we'll move on to the approval of the meeting minutes, uh, August 9th, and then the revised minutes for June 28th. Is there a motion to approve? Mr. Motion to approve. I move we approve the minutes of August 9th, 2021. Second. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Joyner. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote on approving the minutes of August 9th. Dr. Joyner? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Dr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Bolton? Yes. Mr. Conaway? Yes. Are the students on, Dr. White? Maybe in the, okay, waiting room? No. I will double check, but no, they were not. Okay. Mayor Elliker? Yes. And I am a yes as well, and so the minutes pass. Next would be the revised minutes of June 28th. Is there a motion to approve, Mr. Wilcox? I move we approve the minutes of uh, June 28th, 2021. Second. Thank Second. You, Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Uh, any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, uh, we'll vote on the June 28th minutes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Dr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Conway? Yes. Mr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Joyner? Yes. So my students, uh, Mayor Elliker? Yes. And I am a yes as well. And so June 28 minutes passed. Uh, moving on to the superintendent's report. Any action items? Thank you, Madam President, and good evening, board. And members of the public who are watching and listening. The first item I have is that of an MOU for acting chief financial officer. As you know, we have been searching for a chief financial officer without much success. We've carried out a couple of interviews. We um, had selected a company called Resource to do search for us, but they were not coming up with anything. And so we went back to posting on Connecticut um, City Reap. We still have not come up with much of anything from there. So in the meantime, while we wait and continue to search, I have worked with the union to come to an agreement for one of our longest serving Admi um, person in the finance department, Ms. Linda Hannans, to be our acting CFO while we continue to search. Ms. Linda Hannans has been working at the central office from she was age 15, that's over 50, almost 49, 50 years, and has moved up through the ranks, have gotten herself educated, and we believe that she is qualified to handle this situation. And it will be up to Ms. Hannans also when she believes it's necessary to also vacate this position. And so with the, with the consent of the board, I'm presenting that as an action item to accept this MOU, which will then go to the city and to the union to sign. Dr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Tracy, I just had a question. You said it's gonna be up to Ms. Hannes to decide when when she vacates the position or is it when if, you find if, someone? If when if she's accepted for this position, if the board approves, and then when we find someone, according to, I sent the document to everyone, according to the document, it's a temporary situation and it's when we find someone that this position will be vacated. Or Ms. Hannans can say, this is too much. I am not continuing with this. So it has it both ways. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. Is there a motion to approve this MOU, Mr. Wilcox? 
I move we approve the MOU. I second the motion. Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Discussion, Mr. Colton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm a little confused by this MOU. Um, it says um, in the heading that it's the city of New Haven on behalf of the New Haven Public Schools. And then on the contract line, it says for the city of New Haven. Why is, is it not the Board of Education or, or New Haven Public School System as opposed to the city of New Haven? As far as I know, she's an employee of the, um, she's now an employee of the school system and will be an employee, a continued employee of the school system. So why is this a contract between the city of New Haven and the union? That's big. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Dr. Tracy. Dr. Turner. I think Dr. Joyner had a question, right? Oh, well, actually, I had a comment regarding uh, Mr. Do Golson's comment. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Joyner. The uh, MOU is, is, is an agreement that the union that represents Mrs. Hannon uh, had to agree to. And we had to go through the process of, of getting that approved. She is, as Mr. Golson said, an employee of the uh, school district. Yes. And she will continue to be an employee to, to the school. But the MOU is between the city, the union, and the board. And so it had to uh, meet those criteria. And while I'm commenting on that, um, I can't think of a better person can I, to do this my, job than Linda Hannon. Can I finish my questions? I, I understand you want to give her her due props, which is which is fine for me, but I had a specific question about the contract. I'd like to finish that, if you don't mind, Dr. Joyner and um, Madam President. Go ahead, Mr. Bolton. I'll come back to you, Dr. Joyner. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Dr. Joyner suggested that this was a contract between the city, the, the school board, and the union. Mm -hmm. I don't see- I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Oh, hold on, Dr. Joyner. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll just say that. I just heard him say that, but that's okay. Uh, the contract says it's a contract between the city and the union. And I, I again, I haven't gotten the answer why um, it's the city of New Haven on behalf of the New Haven schools and why it's not just the New Haven schools. So can someone explain why we are not a signator um, on, this, on this agreement? I mean, why are we even voting on it if we're not a signator on it? I, I don't, I, I'd rather hear that from um, Dr. Tracy or the attorney, um, Madam President. So let, let Dr. Tracy. Can I correct? Okay, can I like to correct? His, I'll, I'll his, come back to you, Dr. Right, thank, you. thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Tracy. I have done MOUs with the teachers union and, and the same thing. They're the ones who draft the MOU and then we sign off on that. So this document said the New Haven Public Schools for the city of New Haven. No, it right? doesn't say that. It doesn't yes. say that. It says that right at the first sentence, the New Haven it's... Public Schools for the city of New Haven no, has it's... determined the need to immediately and temporarily fill the vacant position of the chief financial officer. Then, yes. then, wh then why is it not, why does the title says the city of New Haven and the signature line on the back says the city of New Haven? The city of New Haven on behalf of New Haven Public Schools. Why? AFCME. Why? Because that's a union to which they belong. It's a city union. I'm not worried about the union. I'm worried point about- Point of information. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wilcox, go ahead. Just as a point of information, I'm looking at the all the labor contracts and addendums with this union and all the signatory pages are listed as city of New Haven and signed by various people from the various things. So it, it follows the form that I'm seeing online and I will post the link, I'll, I'll send the link out. Uh, I, I appreciate that, but, I, but my question becomes, why is the Board of Education voting on this if we're not a signatory to it? Attorney Alexiades, you had your hand up. I was going to point out exactly what uh, Mr. Wilcox just pointed out. Uh, this is the, the collective bargaining agreement with Local 3144 is held by the city. Um, and therefore, the MOU is, is, is negotiated uh, and entered into you know, and signed by, uh, by, the city, by the city and the union. Now, as to why the, uh, uh, the board is asked to vote on it, well, you know, you're talking about about the uh, the acting CFO, an officer of the Board of Education, so it's entirely appropriate um, 
that the board vote to approve the arrangement um, and, and the, MPU, the, the, the acting under. Um, it would be rather anomalous for the board, for example, to reject it and then the agreement, the MOU moves to the, the, the signature uh, process. Uh, Madam President, I, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm still a, a little confused um, by this. Um, I guess my question then becomes, who signed the original agreement with 3144? Was it the city or was it the, was it the Board of Education representative? Do you have that information, Antonio Tiannis, or Dr. Tracy? Okay. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. It said if I press the space bar, it would unmute, but that didn't work. <laughs> I'm, I'm scrolling through the agreement so I can tell you who signed it, but. Uh, um, but it's a, it's a, you know, the uh, employees of the board assigned to the board of ed. Um, some of them are subject to collective bargaining agreements, to union contracts that are board of ed only, and others um, are, are are in unions where the city holds the contract and covers both um, regular city employees and and board of ed employees. This is one of those contracts that cover that that covers both. Um, and hence, um, it's it's signed by the city. So, who supervises this employee? Is it a, is it a city of New Haven employee or is it Board of Ed employee? Is that relevant? Yeah, yeah, it is relevant. I mean, what what rights do we have to supervise someone who we don't hire and who we don't fire? That's I not. mean, this contract says this is somebody else's employee. No, it doesn't. To go, uh, Dr. Joyner. Madam Chair, for the purposes of the recording, Secretary, I did not say it was a contract. I said it was a memorandum of, 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 of agreement, okay. which is different. Okay. And okay. Uh, in the interest of uh, efficiency, uh, I think it's been explained pretty clearly why it is stated away. I think Mr. Wilcox made the point that it's precedented and that uh, this does not any in any way subvert the authority of the school board and the superintendent to supervise the employee. Madam President, I would like to see that in writing from our legal counsel. I like to see I like to see from our legal counsel what authority the board of, of the, the New Haven Public School System, the Board of Ed, have in regards to these contracts. Who is supposed to sign these contracts, and who are these staff members responsible to? It is not. It is not a contract. It's a memorandum okay. The, the memorandum of agreement, MOU, MOUs and contracts and agreements, whatever you want to call them. I like to know when. I like to get a legal opinion from our attorney as to who's responsible for signing off on those and what our what our responsibility as board members are. Why we would be voting on an MOU that we are not partners to. I like, I like to know what the legal opinion and Mr. Joyner and Mr. Wilcox, they can all, you know, say it's precedence. I like to know why it's precedence and what authority we have. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Wilcox. Well, I personally, I think the reason why we're going to be voting on this is because this, as the result of this memorandum, it's going to expend funds of, that are controlled by the New Haven Board of Education for a New Haven employee. So, um, but as I've said, I, you know, all the other addendums, everything else uh, on the contracts are signed by city of New Haven people, a variety of things. So, but, you know, I'm all for getting a legal opinion in writing uh, or to explain that. I think that's great. We have many of these contracts. So, um, all, you know, we're an educational board. So I'm all for providing education to the board and to the public. So I'm, I'm certainly not gonna speak against that, but I'm certainly gonna be voting for this um, memorandum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Bolton? Thank you, Madam President. That just muddied the waters even more. Uh, Mr. Wilcox made it clear that we're spending our money on this position, then why are we not a signator to the contract? Um, so yes, I agree with um, Mr. Mr. Wilcox. We are a board of education and we should be providing education 
to everybody, including us, uh, as to why we do what we do and what the, our legal rights and responsibilities are. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilcox. Seeing no further discussion, we'll vote on the MOU. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Bolton? Um, thank you, Madam President. I'm going to abstain on this item since it is one of those items that we did not receive in advance to review until, well. Just, just we, 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 vote, we, please, I'm, Mr. I'm sorry. Just we, re vote. we received um, in our packages, but we're, we're not posted. please, Mr. Bolton. Abstain. Thank you. Dr. Jackson? Yeah. Mayor Elliker? Yes. Dr. Joyner? Yes, emphatically. Hopefully. <laughs> Mr. Conaway? Yes. The students are still not here. Uh, and I am a yes, and so that MYU motion passes. Please continue, Dr. Tracy. Thank you so much. And with that said, let me now introduce the, what we call the blues, the blue sheet, the personal report. And we have voted on the MOU. So now on this personal report, um, I have Miss Linda Hannon to be our chief financial officer in the interim. Mr. Michael Finley to be chief of staff my chief of staff and Mr. Adam Conway to be interim assistant principal for Davis Street School. And we have a number of appointments on this blue sheet. So I'm asking for the board to please accept the personal report. Mr. Wilcox. Madam President, I'm gonna make a motion to, um, in a moment, I'm gonna make a motion to accept this personnel report. Before I do so, I just want to know if there's anybody that wants anything separated out um, so that we can vote on it separately. I see Mr. Conway. Conaway. Yeah, I, I want to I want to recuse myself from this um from this personnel report. From the whole report, sir, or the um no, I'm just just to keep it clean, I'm gonna recuse myself from the entire okay. report. All right. I'm not hearing anything else, so I'm uh, Madam President, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the action items of the personnel report. I'm Second. Sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilcox. Uh, there, yes, was item, uh, there was one item that I wanted to separate separate it out. I okay. think we have I think we have a contract on there with the city for our legal services for an employee. Uh, this is the personnel this report. This is the personnel. So. Oh, the personnel. Personnel. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. There a second to Mr. Wilcox? I seconded, yes. Thank you, Dr. Junior. I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Mr. Bolton and then Dr. Joyner. Thank you, Madam President. Um, there were a couple of items on this agenda. That, again, we didn't get the um, backup information. Um, the backup information wasn't posted for the public. Um, I'm going to therefore abstain um, on this report, voting on this report. Thank you, Madam President. Bolton. Dr. Joyner? I'd like to comment about, uh, actually, two, two of the people up here. First of all, Adam Conaway. Adam Conaway is the kind of young leader that we need in this city, in this state, and in this country. I know firsthand because one, my daughter taught him, and two, my grandchild was his student. And his, that's his favorite teacher. And for him to say that during a time of COVID, he, he loves all of his teachers. But all I could hear about over the course of last year was, was Mr. Conaway, Mr. Conaway, Mr. Conaway. And he is, he's cut from the same cloth as his mother and his father. He's bright, committed, ethical, and uh, a, a servant of the highest order. As far as Linda Hannans is concerned, um, reminded of a gospel song called he was there all the time but in this case she was there all the time uh, i think linda is is a phenomenal human being that has all the intellect and, and everything else she needs in order to do a great job and she knows this city well and its residents and she comes from a great family and uh 
I almost wish we had thought to do this a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm strongly supporting this, this roster of personnel that Dr. Tracy is hiring. Dr. Turner. I see no further discussion. We'll vote on the personnel report. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Uh, Mr. Golton? Abstain. Mr. Conway? Recuse. Dr. Jackson? No. Dr. Joyner? Yes. Mayor Elliger? Yes. And I am a yes as well. And so that motion passes. Um, please continue, Dr. Tracy, with the sabbatical request. Thank you so much, Board. Thank you so much. Um, President, Madam President, going... point of order, Madam President. Ahead, I Mr. have a Wilson. question. I have a question regarding the, the second part of the blue sheets that we're not voting on. I have, I have two questions regarding this document. Is that not in the superintendent's report later on? Uh, is it? Now. I mean, what's, it's, it's, the, what's the question on the... On the um... All right, there, there's two questions. They're fairly simple questions. The, the positions where there were transfers of teachers, are any, do any of those transfers come with um, raises to their um, salaries or they no. their no. lateral changes? No. Lateral changes? Okay. And my, my second question is why this, there's a doc, the item on page seven of that where it's a rescinded resignation. So I'm assuming that that person has this, um, was residing and then rescinded their resignation and now we're hiring them in a different position, is that correct? Was this person mm -hmm. always, was this person always the site coordinator for Hill Central, or is this a Same new position person. for this person? It's not a new position. It's just, so she was she was already site coordinator for the Hill um, Central. Yes, from my understanding, yes. So there's no extra money, or that's going to be. If uh, if there were monies involved, it would not have been on that side. It would have been an action item. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Jackson? Yes, you can um, direct me to another part of the meeting, but I just have a question about the, I was waiting for the right time about the questions from public comment. When will those be answered and how will, and how will we get the answers to those? Dr. Tracy. Um, so the questions, some of the questions are the questions and concerns that were raised at the last meeting are under August 9th, posted on New Haven Public School site under board August 9th. Thank you, the Tracy. questions, the answers? And the, yes, the responses, yes. And that's where we'll be posting. So if there are concerns raised tonight, those will be posted on the tonight board. That's where we're keeping that. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Tracy. You're welcome. So let me take this opportunity to bring in Miss Linda Hannans. I must say while she's getting in, Miss Linda Hannans started her career in New Haven Public District 49 years ago at age 15. And as part of a work study program, she attended school and worked part time in the business office as a fire clerk. And upon graduation from Wilbercross High School, she was hired to work full time as an account clerk. Linda's career goal was to be a secretary as she liked to dress up. And anyone knows Linda knows Linda likes to dress up. So she even worked part-time at Macy's to supplement her clothing budget. With the goal of being a secretary, she enrolled in Stone Academy where she quickly found out that she was not cut out to be a secretary. She left Stone Academy, went to South Central Community College, now Gateway, where she earned her BAS in business administration. Then she went to Southern Connecticut State University, got her um, business administration degree, went to University of New Haven and got her master's in public administration, all the time working full-time and raising her son, Duane. 
Linda mm -hmm. also obtained her initial educator certificate, 085, as school business administrator from the Conecuh Department of Education. I have could say a lot more about Linda, but Linda is committed to New Haven Public Schools. You know people when they're committed. They're not going anywhere. Through the thick, through the thin, through whatever it is, they are here. They stay with the ship. And Linda is one of those individuals who stayed with the ship. And I could not find a more fitting person to offer this position to at this time as an acting chief financial officer. She knows where everything is. <laughs> just have to go to Linda. <laughs> And she's very, very well respected by yep. the community of educators. So where's Linda? Linda, I'm sorry, you got to say something. There you go, Linda. <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear you, Linda? All right. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the board and thank Dr. Tracy for allowing me to take this next step in my life. Um, you know, I've always been one of those background people, just let me do my job. And then I said to myself, but this is a rewarding next step for me. Um, I, I, I wrote a speech, but of course I forgot my whole speech and stuff. Um, but I just want to say, you know, being a product of New Haven, I would, and, you know, going through the school system in New Haven, graduating from Wilbur Cross, working part-time at the Board of Education, and I had a great mentor, which is Frank Altieri. And I'm sure right now he's smiling down on me saying, go, Linda, you finally did it. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for having the faith in me to move forward with this new chapter of my life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. The next person is someone that I think we may not know, but it's someone we have interviewed and have selected to be the chief um, chief of staff. Dr. Michael Finley is from Griffin, Georgia, 40 miles south of Atlanta. He earned his bachelor's degree in education from Georgia State University and graduated with a doctoral degree in education administration from Georgia Southern University and completed the executive leadership program for superintendency at University of Connecticut. He has 16 years of experience in education at the elementary and secondary levels, and he worked in Clayton Con County Public Schools in Georgia as a teacher for seven years as an assistant principal, and then he relocated to Connecticut, where he became principal of Jamoke Academy for five years, and now he's servicing uh, one of those alternative schools in Rhode Island as executive director. It's called UCAP. He believes that all students can learn when provided the proper resources for success and he has high, high expectations, not only for himself, but for our students. There is Dr. Finley. Dr. Finley, you're in the hot seat. Say a few words. Um, good evening, um, New, New Haven community. Um, first and foremost, um, thank you to the board and thank you to Dr. Tracy and the interview committee for providing the opportunity, um, this great opportunity to become a part of the New Haven Public Schools um, District. I'm humbled and I'm gracious for the approval to join the New Haven community and team. Um, I'm committed to the vision and the mission um, of the district and look forward to collaborating uh, with all stakeholders um, to produce um, great outcomes for our students. Um, thank you again um, and have a wonderful evening. I appreciate it. Congratulations. Con congratulations. But this is so random, Mr. Finley. My auntie lives in Griffin. By the race, I, so I, I've been to Griffin. It's so <laughs> random. She's a good woman. Congratulations, Mr. Finley. Great. Congratulations, Mike. Slam dunk. <laughs> Thank you. You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Tracy. Dr. Tracy. You're, 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 all right, all right, I'm sorry, yeah. We have one of our own, Mr. Adam Conway, who is all, a product of New Haven, graduated from New Haven Public School. And I'm so pleased when I see these folks who actually graduate from New Haven Public Schools and they're coming back to give their service to the district. Um, he went to County Mid West Hills Middle School, Hill Regional High School, 
And then he returned. He went away for school. I guess he was sent away. <laughs> he went away and he returned to New Haven um, during um, his undergraduate years and completed his degree at Southern. He worked also as a substitute teacher. He moved to Wexford Grant as a graduate intern for the New Haven University of New Haven, completed his student teaching at Nathan Hale, and then went to Davis Street School, where he has been all this time. One thing I admire about him, and after I spoke to others about him, is that he is this person who goes outside and do additional things. He was not just confined to just being in the classroom. He takes on other responsibilities in the school, supporting the school, supporting the family, supporting the principal and the vision and mission of the school. So I'm proud to present him as an intern assistant principal, Mr. Conway. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to the Board of Education and the rest of the New Haven community. Um, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Tracy, for giving me this opportunity to continue to serve New Haven here at Davis Academy as the interim assistant principal. I wanna give a very special thank you to Sequala Coleman, principal of Metropolitan Business Academy now. Uh, for the past six and a half years, she took me under her wings um, and mentored me during her time at Davis. Um, I'd like to thank my new principal, Marissa Asarisi, who will now take me under her wings at Davis. Um, thank you to the entire Davis family for being supportive of me as I'm transitioning into my new role here at the school. I'm truly honored to help lead such an amazing school. I love our staff, our students, and their families. Um, I want to thank my family for supporting me. I'm extremely excited for this school year to continue to serve our city of New Haven. That's near and dear to my heart in my new role at Davis as interim assistant principal. Again, thank you. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Congratulations. 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 Madam to President. To you and to, to your daddy, too. Congratulations. Madam President. Congratulations, uh, sir. <laughs> Madam President, we have two young men that were appointed tonight that have Georgia roots. Uh, Mr. Conway's grandmother and grandfather, and of course, uh, Dr. Michael Finley, who was also a pretty good baller in his day. Congratulations to you both and to the proud papa. So that concludes my- I don't think I've ever seen you smile that much, Mr. Conway. <laughs> Sure, it's hard raising boys. I'm a proud, I'm a proud father right now. When it comes to your <laughs> babies, that's right. You should be. You should be. You I feel proud in. too. You put the time in, bro. And my wife did too. I know. I she's she's yeah. an unsung hero in all of this. Yeah, that's right. She did, she did most of the work, so you know. No, but, but she's an unsung hero. Yeah. So thank you very much, and I appreciate um, asking the questions and accepting these individuals as part of our public school system. We are very appreciative of that. So moving on, Madam President, can I continue to move on? Yes, please. So there is now a sabbatical request. Sabbatical request from one of her own Miss Carolyn Streets. She has gotten the scholarship, Fulbright scholarship to study abroad or to work with another school system abroad to learn more information and to come back and share it with New Haven Public Schools. And I have to put that through as part of what we do with the board to accept her request for going on sabbatical. The document is in your packet. Is there a motion to accept Mr. Wilcox? I move we accept the sabbatical proposal. For a second, Dr. Jackson, are you? I have, I have a question. Okay, hold, hold on. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Go ahead, Dr. Jackson. Oh, okay. I, I just, um, I just, this is the first time that we've ever gotten one. Do, do all sabbaticals come to us? And then also, how does it differ from just a regular leave of absence? Why do we vote on it? Tracy? Yes, um, based on the union, yes, they come to the board. We have not done sabbatical for a long time. 
in New Haven Public School, but they do come to the board. Can you, can you just and let people know what it is? The people that oh, are- it, it comes to the board. Um, this is when staff members may request to whether study abroad or do other things or go on some mission. Hold on one moment, please. Hold on. Get out. You're not muted, Dr. Tracy. Oh, you're, you're muted now. <laughs> <laughs> that they will come back and represent the school system. So Ms. Caroline Streets put in a request, oh goodness, put in a request to take this sabbatical. She has been going at this for quite a while and um, we are bringing it to the board so that because it involves paying her a certain amount of her salary while she's abroad. That's why I have to bring it to the board. And um, Ms. Lisa, is Lisa on here? Lisa and others vetted this so they could give some more information on, on this. We believe it's a worthy cause to support her in this. Where's Lisa? Lisa Mack, go ahead, Lisa. Lisa? Lisa? Maybe Lisa? something wrong with her audio with the microphone. Okay, because I'm not I'm not hearing her. Yeah, she's not muted, but we can't hear her. So I'm going to send her out and bring her back in. The process is that you can you can deny it or you can accept it. And so that's why I'm bringing it to the board. I'm bringing it to the board because it involves paying a part of her salary while she's away. So just wanted to make sure we're doing this right. Lisa Mack, go ahead, please. Ms. Lisa Mack. Ms. Mack, you're, you're muted. You're muted, Ms. Mack. Yeah. Oh, she's not there. <laughs> yeah, she's there, she's connecting. She's connecting. Uh -huh. Okay, I don't, I see her background, but I don't see her in it. <laughs> Lisa, are you there? Well, I guess it connects by itself. I don't know. <laughs> she might have just stepped out just as you were asking. Mr. Wilcox had a question and then Dr. Joyner. Yeah, Mr. See Wilcox. if she comes back. Uh, yeah, my question was just going to be because this was new to me as well, because I haven't seen these before. I did go take a look at the contract and I just wanted to have you confirm, Dr. Tracy. The, the contract mentions a sabbatical committee that would yeah. review this, make recommendations mm -hmm. to you, and then you send it to us. I just wanted to make sure since this is the first of these I'm seeing that that process sure. was yes. followed and, and just get a sense of who's on, you know, what's a sabbatical committee look like in the district? Uh, who reviews this, I guess, is the other question, is the main question. So uh, Matt, thanks for asking that. So there are um, three administrators and there's um, the union, three union members from the teachers union who are part of reviewing this and they, they agreed to what was there because it was well written well done and what she said she would be doing abroad and what she could bring back to the school system for that it's it's Fulbright scholarship is a great thing to be offered to our our teachers this is not a small fee it's something that is notable and we would not want to rob her of that chance to participate okay thank you Miss Mack, oh. she, she's there, but it seems we're having just technical difficulty that with her being able to connect. Okay, thank you. Dr. Joyner and then Dr. Jackson. Okay, I'd like to add a little bit to what Dr. Tracy has said. Uh, one, this young lady has, has given so much beyond her regular work day to the district. Uh, I've known her since she was a kid. And um, she, she's a phenomenal teacher. She's one of the best teachers I've ever seen. And um, she does, like Adam, she does, not, she does not watch the clock. I think the other reason why we should approve it is that the teachers union has been very supportive of what we've been trying to do. The fact that they uh, froze salaries, of, uh, uh, I think that was a biggie. And uh, Dave has always been above board, and I think that we should find as many opportunities as we can to reward our teachers. 
and I would strongly support this. And it's very, it is prestigious to have a Fulbright scholar. And the more we can do in the urban districts to improve our image and to help people understand that we are in fact, probably doing a better job and working harder than most school systems uh, because we have such a challenge in front of us. Um, so further clarification and explanation of that is in the packet that was sent to the board members. This grant length, a grant length is five to six months duration. She's going to Finland. Okay. So it's I Finland. have, I have Ms. Mack on speaker. Can you hear her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good evening, board. So just to give a little background, I was watching you. Miss Mack, please mute your 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 computer. We can't hear what she's saying. Okay, I, I think though that Matt has um, actually explained, asked about the process and that was explained. So if there are other questions, um, please ask. Go ahead, Dr. Jackson. Um, just for transparency's sake, since this is, this is you know, um, encumbering her salary to support her on her Fulbright scholarship, um, who, was, who were the people on the committee and um, what percentage of her salary will, will we be covering? 100%, like, is there a percentage or the whole thing? It's it's a percentage of her salary. I think it's two thirds okay, of her so salary. The webinar. Okay, Miss Mack is here and now can speak. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Lisa? Okay, so the... so, what was the question? Because I had to block all the way off because oh. of the sound echo. Yeah, the question was who, who were the people of the committee? I will, um, the names of the committee members who reviewed this application um, for transparency's sake need to be, we need to know who they are and we would like to know. And also um, what percentage of her salary will the district be um, covering for her um, Fulbright experience? Okay, so the members of the committee were executive management as well as the teachers union. That's as per the teacher's contract. So I'll provide you the names of the or the can the, the, and the, the panel that actually met. And so again, that included members of NHFT as well as um, executive appointed management from the, the Board of Education. Also, part of her salary is three quarters of her salary the time she's taking. So she, as you noticed, if you read the information that was submitted in the packet, she's only requesting not the entire school year, she's questioning a portion of the school year. So so three quarters of her salary will be compensated. She'll be paid three quarters of her cash salary for the time she's out. So she's not an out an entire school year, so she will be paid for the full school year, which is another a great opportunity for her because we won't have to lose a teacher for the entire school year. Any other questions uh, for Ms. Mack? Who, who was the committee? Who were the people on the committee? So it was, so I, I get the names and said, do you need the names right now? Cause I can send that to you guys, the whole entire board via email. No, we're on the, we're on the, we're on the public meeting now. Okay. So I have to look at the list, but I know it's Dave Chicarella. He was a part of the committee as well as Jonathan Wilson. Cause I remember three members of the NHFT, Dave Chicarella, Jonathan Wilson, which is Peter Wilson. And a number I have to look them. I have to get that information for because I don't have it accessible right here. But I can look it up in my email. While you guys are, give me a second. Oh, okay. 
Madam Chair. Yes, Dr. Goats. Dr. Joyner, could, sorry. Could we post those names at the next board meeting? Or put them someplace so that uh, someone could see them? If she can find them in the next couple of minutes, I'll move on with Mr. Goldson. Uh, but if not, they can be posted. Thank you, Madam Thank President. You, Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to know how much this is costing us. Um, if we're paying her salary, what part? How much is how much is that total in total? Um, how much are we paying to replace her? Because apparently we're going to have someone covering that class, whether it's a substitute or another certified teacher. Somebody's going to be covering that class. So, how much is that going to cost us? Um, and I assume because it's a Fulbright scholarship that it comes with some sort of um, scholarship with some sort of funding. So I'd like to know what that is because at the end of the day, uh, we can't, you know, I, I, I su fully support her going off and doing this. I think it's great, uh, but I'd like to know how much it costs us because we all, we're always crying broke and we haven't seen to manage to find money to pay our paraprofessionals yet, but we're doing $78,000 raise. We did a $78,000 raise tonight um, and we're getting ready to pay a teacher to go um, to go to um, Finland. Um, so I like to know how much that costs us. And I like it on the record uh, on how much it costs us so that um, when we're saying we don't have enough money uh, to pay our paraprofessionals a living wage, uh, I, I would have a better picture of what we actually have. Thank you, Madam President. Dr. White. Yeah, uh, yes, the line's still open. Okay, okay. Uh, Ms. Mack has the names. So the sabbatical committee is, is made up of three members of NHFT, as I mentioned earlier, and three members from the Board of Ed. The sabbatical committee panel consisted of Dave Chicarella, the NHFT president, um, Pat DeLucia, the um, vice president, and Peter Wilson, John Peter with Jonathan Wilson, also known as Peter Wilson. And from the Board of Ed, it was Sequela Coleman, the SAA president, Kanika Ingram Mann, Man, senior talent recruiter, and Ivalice Velasquez, who could, were not was part of the committee, but was unable to attend the committee meeting because of conflict and another um, meeting or, or another scheduled appointment. And, and we do have approximate costs. I don't have that readily available at this time, but we did do approximate costs of what it would cost um, to what it would cost to pay her during her time of at leave, as well as the approximate cost. We can only provide approximate cost what it would cost to fill a substitute teacher, or if we have a full-time teacher in that or a part-time teacher, we can do approximate cost based on certified teacher's rate and substitute teaching rate per day. So what are those costs? I'll send you the information that was submitted. But you're that asking us to make... Is, you're, you're I can certainly to, share that. I can retrieve it now because I'm on my computer, but that information wasn't... The request was to submit the, her request to the board to vote on. But you're, Most of the costs was no, not... We did calculate it, but it was not requested to be submitted, so... No, no disrespect, but every every oh. time you ask us to spend money, you tell us what that money is. You're asking us to spend money here. You're not telling us what it is. Uh, with all due respect, I mean, that should be common sense that, you know, if, if you're going to ask us to, to approve this, that's one thing. If you're going to ask us to approve this with a price tag on it, then we should know what that price tag is. Okay, no problem. Dr. Joyner. Yes. Go ahead and then Mr. Wilcox. Oh, I'm done. I don't have anything. 
Mr. Wilcox. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, so what I think I'm being asked to do is follow the contract language with the union that we signed this contract. Everything I'm seeing in the contract language is what I'm being told tonight. Things seem to be matching up there. I'm all for full transparency. I'm very happy to have this as a discussion item on the FNO meeting so that it's a, we could discuss this further in a public meeting and get the exact costs uh, uh, for her remuneration as well as estimated cost of what a substitute would be. Uh, I think that this would definitely become an issue if we did this more than like once every decade or two. So I, I definitely think that um, if, if this is going to become a more regular practice, that, that, you know, we should clarify what some of the expectations are. But uh, so far, everything I'm hearing is precisely what's on pages 16 and 17 of the teachers union contract outlining exactly. And if we didn't want to approve these, we shouldn't have it in our contracts because the contracts matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Madam President. It's about good governance. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, a board doesn't vote on an item that has a price tag attached to it without knowing what the price. A good board, a, 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 a good board doesn't vote on an item um, that has a price tag on it and not know what the price tag is. I don't care what contract is it. We have contracts, we have contracts with the teachers union and every week we have tires that have the number that we're hiring them at every single meeting. So this is no different. This is an item that has a price tag to it. The only difference is we don't know what it is. And, and to, and to su suggest just because it's in the contract we should be approving it. Well, we don't do that every week. Every week we approve teacher hires with the with the listing of how much those teachers hires cost us. Same thing with the administrators, same thing with the paraprofessionals. We get that information. That information is not available here. It is not fair to say just because it's in the should be concerned about how much it costs us because we should be. Uh, that is a, a sign of good governance. And, and it's one of the reasons why we ended up with a $10 million deficit a couple of years ago because we weren't asking these questions. And, you know, we may, be, we may be swimming in money right now, but we won't be in a couple of years. And we need to put good governance in place now so we don't get back to that position where we go begging again to, um, to be able to keep our teachers and, and forcing our teachers to take um, a year without um, their their raises. So I have um, information when you're ready to yep. because, because we um we're lacking in funds. So you know, good governance here. Let's let's figure out how much it costs us. Thank you, Dr. White, and then Mr. Wilcox. Uh, Miss Mack is ready to share more information. So the salary amount that we would be we look into backfill would be thirty five thousand four sixty three for the time for all she's on our sabbatical leave request. So we, we, the district would be paying thirty five thousand four sixty three. As an estimated cost for for putting someone in her classroom. Correct. Uh, a you, certified you teacher, a certified applicant to, to fill her position while she's out. That's the cost for filling her position while she's out. The time that she's out, correct. And how much of her salary are we um, are we giving her for being out? Three quarters of her salary, which would be 48000 approximately 48005 for the time she's out because of where she is currently on, on the teacher's salary step. So it's costing us about $85,000 to cover this position while she is is taking this um, sabbatical, is that is that a fair um, statement? Um, yeah, yeah, close, yeah, approximately. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Um, yeah, uh, shockingly, that's. A percentage of a salary that we know what maximum teacher salaries are and can extrapolate from that. But I'm fully supportive of this uh, sabbatical leave and I'm hoping we can move on from this soon and vote it up or down. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Goldson. 
Madam President, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I would like for this lady to take a sabbatical. I would have certainly have voted for it if it didn't have a price tag attached to it. Um, I have not seen us put the, this kind of effort into defending paying living wages for paraprofessionals that we're doing for these kind of things. And, and because of that, um, I am not going to vote for um, this item un until I see some movement or other items like this until I see some movement on the paraprofessionals pay. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay, seeing no further. Uh, oh, Mayor Elliker, go ahead. Well, just I want to know, Mr. Conway has hand up a number of times. You did, I did, Mr. Conway. You're at the bottom of my screen. Use your use the um, raised hand function so okay. that I can. Because then, you, I'm, I'm then a, you'll I'm be a, at the top of my screen. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm at the top of my screen, so. Yeah, but I, yeah, I just want to I want to support this sabbatical um, specifically for um, the it, because it's a Fulbright. That's uh that's number one. Number two, it's not costing the district, um, you know, um, a lot more money. But I, I also agree with my um, board colleague that we do need to pay this type of attention to uh, livable wages for um our uh, paras and other lower paid individuals. So um, that's the point I wanna make. So I am gonna separate the items. I do support the Fulbright Scholar, but I also want to uh, take this time to say that I do wanna support paras and uh, other lower, lower salary, salary staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Mayor Elliker. Um, did did the, committee, the, the committee voted unanimously to support does Ms. Mack know the answer to that? Or Dr. Tracy? Not on anymore. Hold on. Um, May I, Elka, can you repeat the question yes. for Ms. Mack? They did. Did the committee vote unanimously to support it? Yes. Yes, they did. And, and Dr. Tracy, yes. do you believe you can manage the lack of this one employee for the time period? It's just, yes, it's just one of how many hundred employees, yes. And, and I think Mr. Wilcox's point is an important one. Is there anything in the contract language that uh, makes it so we're not going to have 50 people request this in two months? And then in order for us to be fair, you know, we're going to have to really consider th th that situation as well. Is there any so, kind of restriction on how many people get a sabbatical annually or any, anything like that? That I'm not sure is something in the contract as to a number, but it still comes to the board to make that decision, yay or nay. So that's the part that is in there. And it depends on what is presented to the committee. So it's, we've seen in the past where they rejected sabbaticals because the way it was written and what was coming back to the district was not worth the while. And so it was rejected. Okay. Well, it, um, it's so, go ahead. No, if I may add um, to the board, so in past requests, we have received numerous requests in the past, and I'm not saying just in recent past, but over the last couple of years. And if once they present it, if there's not voted unanimously among the committee that's convened to discuss the request, then it's not even it's submitted to the superintendent advising what their outcome was. So. If the quest wasn't unanimous, it would not even get to the point that's presented to the board. Just so, just to ensure this is this request was was supported by the majority of the committee, and therefore that's why it was presented to the superintendent as such. Okay. Thank you, uh -huh. yeah. Dr. Jackson. Um, I just want to say, in the next time that we get a request like this. Could we have it so that, I mean, there were a lot of questions because it wasn't clear um, um, the process, um, what we, what the price tag, I mean, there, I think there are a lot of things here that could have been prepared that would have made this a lot easier to understand. Um, not, you know, just on my part, but also the public. Um, because right now, you know, if someone doesn't really quite grasp a sabbatical, which a, a lot of us who are who are in education, certain levels of ed education, understand what a sabbatical is. But if you don't, it looks like we're paying her 
to go like on an internship or something, which, you know what I'm saying? So I think that for the next time, the package should be a lot tighter so that folks can understand what's going on. And we would have voted on this a long time ago. So please, the next time a sabbatical comes up, please have the package, Dr. Tracy, complete um, and tighter so that um, we wouldn't have to waste all this time. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Okay, seeing no further discussion, we'll vote on uh, the sabbatical request for Ms. Carolyn Streets. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Dr. Jackson? Yes. Dr. Joyner? Yes. Mr. Bolton? Abstain. Mr. Conway? Yes. Mayor Elliker? Yes. And I am a yes as well. And so that motion passes. Finance and operations report. Um, Mr. Wilcox, the action items. Thank you very much. Before I move the action items, are there any that people would like to be moved separately? Um, Mr. Goldson? The um, legal counsel position, if you don't mind. Certainly. I think, I think it's number eight. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, just to make it easy, um, what I'll do is first move that one separate from the rest and then I'll make a motion to move the rest of them. So, uh, so this is agreement number eight listed on the agenda, an agreement with City of New Haven Corporation Council. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve agreement number eight as was recommended by the Finance and Operations Committee. Second. Dr. Joyner. Second. Discussion. Second. Mr. Bolton. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as I said last year, and, um, this this um the, the original um suggestion for doing this was that it was going to save us money, but I have not seen a reduction in our legal costs. Um, I'm not quite sure why we didn't just hire our own legal counsel as opposed to um paying for the salary of an, of an employee of another organization who we don't have any supervisory um, relationship with. Um, I don't understand that, that whole setup. Um, I think it's brought for failure. One day it's going to cause us problems um, and it could have been done in a much different way. I'm not quite sure why it was done this way. Um, and um, I don't, I'm not necessarily opposing the person who is in this position as I am opposing um, this, um, the way this position is funded and quite frankly, the way it came to us in the first place. Um, so I'm going to vote against this item. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Bolton, Mayor Elliker. Uh this is a, a contract for $30,000 for the year, uh, which is uh, far beyond the, uh, the cost of the quality and time that is put in by the attorney involved. Um, it, I think that uh, it's important for us to support this because it is in the best interests of the Board of Education to have an attorney on our side that helps advise us engage out outside attorney when necessary, um, but uh, mostly because I think this is a real steal. Uh, we have incredible expertise as provided to us by someone that has uh, unmatched integrity. And I think we, we should all be supporting this item. Thank you, Mayor Alaker. Dr. Jackson and then uh, Dr. Joyner. I think the mayor kind of answered my question, but I'll ask anyway. So um, is this position dedicated to the Board of Ed or are there other duties along? Does this attorney, you know what I'm saying? Is he like exclusively Board of Ed or no? No. Okay, thank you. Dr. Jackson, Mr. Goldson. Oh, sorry, Dr. Joyner and then Mr. Goldson. Well, first of all, I'd like to support this. I have seen, um, I don't think you can separate the person from the position. 
uh, I have seen so much growth and patience and and calm and integrity in, in, the, in this person that we have selected for this position. And I think that changes in, in, in various sectors of the city uh, makes this a lot more acceptable to me. Uh, I believe that integrity is the hallmark of, of what it means to be a good human being. And he certainly has the intellect and the work ethic. Uh, and, and he has a common effect. Um, I need that. Uh, and I'm not going <laughs> to criticize myself for being assertive because it got me to where I am now. But you always need people around you that can you know, calm, calm you and uh, help you regain perspective. And, and Elias has been uh, excellent. And I know how much uh, educational attorneys charge districts. And, and I also know how much lawyers make if they decide not to, to be in public service and work in a city or in a um, state or federal capacity. And I think he has been uh, very, very, very good for our district and someone that is highly trustworthy and a class act. And the more people we can have around us that are class acts, the better off we'll be as a, as a nation, as a state, as a city, as a family, as any kind of human group. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Mr. Bolton. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to reiterate what I said earlier. This is not about the person. It's about the position. I, I could separate that out. Um, quite frankly, uh, this, is, this has never been about the person. Um, Mr. Alexianis and I have, have had differences of opinions have, have I, as I have had with other people um, with the administration. Um, and I, I could live with that. Uh, what I can't live with is that we are paying for an employee who we don't supervise, who we don't have any input um, as to um, his evaluation, as to whether he comes or goes, as to when he gets raises, um, and, and so on. And I, and I believe in the last contract, there was a built-in raise to it. Um, my, my question to the, to, the, um, to the finance chair is that, Still the case with this new, with this, with this um, renewal? Uh, the contract language in the memorandum is that if he gets a raise, then we pay, uh, I believe it's 36% of the raise. Uh, but this is coming through at the same amount as last year. So I'm assuming he didn't get a raise or they're not charging us for that. Uh, that, that, that again is, thank you, thank you all, Mr. Chair, that again, reiterates the issue that I'm, that I'm, you know, we built into this contract that the city decides to give them more money, we got to give them more money. We don't even have a, 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 a choice in that process. And, and it makes me feel really uncomfortable. But um, and, and again, it's not about, it's not about Mr. Alexianis, because um, we've been getting, getting along fairly well lately. Um, I've agreed with many of his opinions, especially when they, when they fell my way. But um, I, I, um, I, um, I I just feel uncomfortable about this whole arrangement. It's just it's just different than anything I've ever seen before, and I'm worried that one day it's going to come back to bite us. Um, it's going to come back to bite us very badly. So, thank you, Madam President. Dr. Tracy, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Although I'm not a voting member of the board, I just want to chime in a little bit about what um, Ilya has done for the school system that would cost us a lot more money if we had to go out and, and pay lawyers to do that. Or oh, we have volumes of FOIA requests that come to us and everything goes to Ilya and Ilya deals with all of those things for us plus other opinions that we have that need to be answered. Like right away, he's there to answer for us without having to pay. Because when it comes to Shipman and Goodwin or any other lawyer, every minute counts. Every minute you talk with them is paid for. Not so with Ilya. He services us the best he can whenever we reach out for consultation. I'll, I'll just add to that at any hour of the day. 
night and day, weekends, it doesn't matter, on vacation, at funerals, he's, at any time we called, he, he's there to answer the call. So I'm also supportive of this. Okay, seeing no further um, discussion, we'll vote on the ethanol item number eight, the agreement with board council, Dr. Jackson. Yes. Mr. Wilcox. Yes. Mr. Conaway. Yes. Mr. Bolton. No. Mr. Bolton, no one here. Dr. Joyner. Yes. Mayor Elliker. Yes. And I am also a resounding yes. And so that motion passes. Please continue, Mr. Wilcox. All right, thank you. What I'd like to do now is I'm gonna make another motion, uh, but before I do, I request that if it gets seconded, Madam President, that you come back to me because there's a unique item on here that I wanna draw attention to the board members and the public too. So, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion that we approve the remaining, um, the three abstracts, the remaining seven agreements a one lease agreement, one contract, and two purchase orders as recommended by the Finance and Operations Committee. Mr. Conway, second. second. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Uh, Mr. Wilcox. Thank you very much. I'd just like to draw everyone's attention to a different item than I've, I've not seen it on my um, two and a half years or so on the board. Item C1 is a lease agreement um, that this is a lease agreement with Cornell Scott Hill Health Center to rent 1,657 square feet of the kitchen facility space at 130 Orchard Street from us um, from September 1 to June 30 in an amount not to exceed $47,638. So this is actually, we're receiving this money uh, as was listed in the minutes from the Finance and Operations Committee explained by Mr. Lamb, their current facility, uh, they're needing to leave it and they're seeking an alternative space for their kitchen while the new location is constructed. The organization will pay rent and all costs associated with renovating the space. This is the kitchen area only. Um, it was testified to in the in the finance meeting that food, our food services have no need or use of this space while at this time during this contract period. So we'll be receiving this and we are assured that uh, this comfortably covers all our potential costs and they're assuming all the costs um, with renovating the space. So uh, I did wanna draw everyone's attention to that because um, it's a new thing for us. So I don't know if there's any questions on that, but I'm happy to try to address them or maybe Mr. Lamb can. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Jackson. Dr. Jackson. So is this the Morrill Sheridan building? No. What is Orchard Street, right? Where, yeah. where is that? Yes, okay. that is the old yeah, Morrill Sheridan. Across from Career High School, yes. Yeah. Okay, and so they have a kitchen that they're renting from us. That's the proposal, yes, that they'll rent the kitchen space there, not the cafeteria, none of the other space, but the, the kitchen space, the prep space, the uh, involved updating some equipment there, like the freezer, I think, or the refrigerator is one pricey item that might get updated through this. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Any other discussion? Yeah, I just have one. Wasn't this, isn't this time limited to, isn't it up to one year or something? That's because we, we discussed this in finance and operations. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, th thanks for the reminder. This is for one year with an option to renew for one year. And that option, the, the contract language will be drawn up that it'll, that um, it's, at R and you know they have that option and, and we can choose to move forward with that. But it was testified to that uh, the kitchen area was not needed uh, during this time period. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Jackson, have they toured the building already? So they've already went through it and saw it. 
Mr. I, Lamb? I, yeah, I'd have to defer to Mr. Lamb. They're aware of it. Yes, they've toured to the facility um, along with uh, the our kitchen staff and our facilities department as well. Dr. Joyner? Uh, one of the things I like is that it's time bound because if we find that there's a better use for that building given our fiscal situation and given some of the needs in the city, uh, we, sh we, sh we shouldn't be locked into something that would prohibit um, a different use of it. Of it. Uh, uh, I have actually, and, and I've, I've actually s s said this to Dr. Tracy, some groups of early childhood people have approached me and I say that the only thing I can do is bring it to the superintendent about potential use of that building. Uh, so we should really be careful in terms of how long we have the lease. I think the other thing we have to realize is that when somebody uses a portion of a building, then we need to be aware of how, how we can be vigilant about the portion that they don't use. And, and they should be held liable for anything that happens under their watch. Thank you, Dr. I, Mr. Wilcox, go ahead. Just to address those comments, uh, they did uh, discuss in the meeting, we did ask those questions about security into the other parts of the building. And um, Mr. Lamb assured us that, that they can cut off access to the rest of the building. And they assured us that the contract itself will ensure, include the proper insurances and indemnifications for us so that uh, we're not legally liable for, for any of this. Mr. Ms. Wilcox, you always handle stuff like that. I appreciate that about you. Uh, it's, it's not me, it's the, it's the committee. And any questions that we get from other board members or the public, we, you know, so happy, to, happy to do that. You're the chair of the committee, buddy. I'm just there amongst equals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, though. Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Dr. Jackson? Well, and one more comment. And, and they, and of course, we're going to continue to have the testing center there, though, right? Because they take it up the parking lot. They're, they're going to stay, correct? Okay. Okay. And so now, see, no further discussion. We'll vote on the uh, remaining FNO items. Dr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Conaway? Yes. Mr. Goldson? Yes. Dr. Joyner? Yes. Mayor Elliker? Yes. I'm a yes as well. So those items pass. Moving on to the superintendent's report, Director Bond, health and safety. Good evening. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and board members and those that are online um, this evening. Um, it was nice to see a lot of the uh, products of New Haven get recognized this evening and being part to um, being part of the Board of Education team. And um, as you all know, I am also a product of New Haven, so I like to add to the list of uh, those of us that are committed to our, the city that um, we were wow. raised. Sorry, sorry, I'm home. This is what happens oh. for night meetings. I'm going to be sharing a screen. Do I have sharing privileges? Okay, great. Um, so as you know, um, some of these um, slides were previously covered. And so I thought that it would be great as we are preparing for school reopening to sort of um, highlight some of the things that we collectively done um, in conjunction with the Board of Ed and also give you a sort of a situational awareness of where we are currently with our positivity cases um, both uh, the case rate and the hospitalization rate. So one of the things that we do um, in the city of, of New Haven Health Department and our infectious disease team is really try to work closely on monitoring what's happening, not only globally, but obviously not, um, nationwide, statewide, and then really at the local level, um, particularly granularly to our New Haven County and city of New Haven residents. And so what you see in front of you is some of the things that we've been tracking. And one of those things is sort of what are the cases that are happening um, currently in our city and in, um, in our state. And we're seeing predominantly at this juncture that we're um, seeing del Delta variant very prominent in our city, um, in our state, in our country. Um, as we know, knew it was previously it was a global impact um, and now has transitioned into 
our state. And so um, what we are doing is we're working around messaging and still tracking cases um, and seeing a slight um, a, a increase in cases um, statewide about 3.5% and a positivity rate about 2.6% um, for the citywide. Regionally, as you know, the CDC tracks a little bit differently. So the way that we are tracking, we usually track on a 14 day case rate, whereas um, the CDC, where they uh, post and announce the different transmission levels and the risk levels are looking at a seven day rolling average. And so um, that is the distinction between our rate um, at the state level and local level versus the CDC um, when they're looking at a county based um, um, high risk transmission uh, level of transmission, and right now they're considering us as a high risk transmission, um, as mo so is uh, most of the state. But it, there is a distinct there is a distinct factor of how we are tracking those cases. Um, our hospitalizations is something that we um, is another factor where we look at um, when we're looking at safe reopening of any of our sectors and obviously our schools. Is where are we with hospitalizations within the county? There are about 53 patients that are currently hospitalized of those, about 16% of those patients, 16 patients were fully vaccinated. And so we're keeping close um, watch on the hospitalizations as well. What we know is that some of the in, um, individuals that are vaccinated, there are a couple of things, uh, factors that are, um, we are seeing preliminary, we're seeing that individuals have pre-existing conditions um, or and or obviously now because of the promotion of booster doses, seeing that vaccines could be waning. And so making sure that booster doses are gonna be readily available for the larger community um, and not just those that are immunocompromised. One of the things that changed for the CDC guidance that we wanted to make sure was incorporated and embedded into the protocols, just making sure that all of the different um, CDC changes. Um, one of the major highlights that I wanna point out is the um, fact that those that are vaccinated and been exposed um, three to five days later getting tested for COVID, which is a change um, from the previous recommendations for those that are vaccinated. In addition, CDC also recommends universal indoor masking, which is something that we collectively have been supporting. And so we also talked on high level some of the areas that we work collectively um, together with the Board of Ed leadership team. And so I'll highlight some of that. I know that you have slides in front of you, um, but um, so we will not uh, try to um, belabor any of the points. We can have open discussion as, if necessary. But one of the things that we've done um, with the Board of Ed is really work closely on offering recurring youth vaccination sites and pop-up sites throughout the district and making sure that we're accessible. We are working closely with the school-based health centers on offering um, vaccination sites um, during the academic year, along with our school nurses to making sure that accessibility is not a barrier. And so really proud of the both FQHCs that are um, going to be supporting this effort along with the health department nurses. As you know, the governor has issued a mandate on, um, on August 19th, where he indicated on executive order number 13D, those that pre-K um, pre through uh, 12 school statewide staff must have at least one dose by September 27th, um, otherwise be subject to weekly testing. Um, and they also have the proper uh, medical exemptions um, submitted to the Board of Ed. And so that is a significant change since the last meeting that was held for you two weeks ago. Um, working closely with um, the Department of Public Health on some of the implementation strategies um, that will take place and we'll work closely with the Board of Ed with that factor. And so um, really another aspect of being able to have another uh, mitigation strategy. One of the things that we did is making sure that we presented at the last administrators meeting um, last week where we provided a similar presentation and shared resources to all of our principals to be able to have access to toolkits for educators um, that are accessible and easy, um, you know, health literacy component and infographics so that it could be easy to read and follow. We also um, supported um, the mask, universal masking, but understanding and working on mass breaks um, and working with the district on the mass breaks and cohorting um, and the importance of the cohorting between um, different 
cl classrooms and different groups so that we can be able to support um, and isolate and quarantine as quickly as possible. And then obviously still promoting physical distancing as much as possible within the classrooms. One of the things that we know from last year to this year is that um, we had, uh, we now have a lot of uh, mitigation strategies in place where last year we were sort of still trying to get infrastructure. So making sure that we, um, we had lessons learned and so really limiting access to individuals coming into the schools. Um, so emphasizing that to the administrators um, and making sure that uh, we're closely monitoring that as well. And um, also in this, encouraging for video conferencing, um, meetings as much as possible, lunch breaks, et cetera. So just really providing guidance to um, the school administrators on ensuring that those mitigation uh, strategies are still in place um, and reducing the risk of if any potential exposure. This includes making sure that symptoms are still being tracked um, of employees before um, entry of work. And then obviously health um, hand washing is another factor of, of reducing the risk of exposure. And so making sure that frequent hand washing and sanitizing is easily accessible to um, students and staff throughout the district. And really again, emphasizing um, that anyone that's symptomatic should not be in school. So working closely with the school nursing um, staff when we need to isolate individuals um, and um, that are presenting any uh, potential symptoms and sending them home if they are arrive in school. And this is regarding students. And of course, staff um, are aware of, um, will be completing the, the symptom checks before starting school. So one of the things that we also continue to work with, work is closely with our cleaning and disinfection protocols and making sure that we um, randomly selected schools throughout the district and conducted inspections. Um, we were very pleased um, with the results um, that we, um, we were able to inspect the results of those visits. I'm really proud of um, the progress um, from last year in making sure that school reopening and readiness is in place, in particular to a lot of the cleaning and disinfecting protocols. As you know, we are also working closely with the Board of Ed for technical support and monitoring around contact tracing. This is being led by Dr. White and Eric Pachowski from um, the athletic slash health department. I mean, health, um, is it health? I don't know, he does something with health. I don't know, he has a lot of hats. And so um, really proud of the school health aides where they support a lot of the student, um, the school nurses will handle the, uh, the student tracing and the staff uh, tracing um, will be uh, conducted um, in partnership with the Board of Ed. So we work really closely, closely together with the school nurses and school health aides along with the Board of Ed staff, making sure that we're isolating and quarantining in a timely fashion. We also um, worked really closely on having illustrative protocols. And so I'm not gonna delve into the protocols in depth, but we worked really closely on making sure that the protocols are all up to date with the latest CDC guidances. Every time there's an update, we make sure that we update those protocols um, in support of these efforts. And this is just a scenario, um, another um, workflow that we developed to aid with um, quick decision-making for the team that are um, working on isolating and quarantining. And so this is just an example of some of the technical support that we developed on our end to support um, safe reopening and um, most importantly, the different um, scenarios um, that, this, that the New Haven Public Schools may um, be posed with and also recommendations on the level and the duration of quarantining um, as well as testing. And so testing, um, of course, we've been very fortunate that we had a pilot this past summer that Dr. White, um, I think, highlighted two weeks ago. Uh, we are one of the eight districts that were approved for pre-K, for um, K through 12 testing. And so that is going to be um, an asymptomatic testing um, opportunity um, for our schools. And we are very fortunate um, that, that it will be going through, at least through the winter, to be able to um, aid with that support and be able to offer um, testing to um, and screening. And that really is another uh, major mitigation factor that can um, easily be able to isolate and quarantine. And this will be offered on a weekly basis. Um, and no public health uh, nurse coverage was something that was mentioned um, in one of the public comments. Public health nurse coverage is uh, vital uh, to safe um, school functions. And so we are working um, closely. They um, are working, our clinic director is working with um, our nurses. We just had a workforce development training today. There's going to be nurse coverage 
um, throughout the school district and we will be working closely with the principals. We have assessed um, a couple of things this particular uh, summer. We worked on compliance, acuity levels, and um, also looking and making sure that um, the isolation rooms are ready for reopening. So um, working towards that effort and making sure that um, we are going to be all set to reopen safely um, in the next week and a half. And then also working, as you know, with the bus companies, um, working closely, um, the Board of Ed continues to uh, work with the leadership with the bus companies. And so happy that they have mitigation strategies in place. This was discussed two weeks ago. Um, but as you know, we will continue to provide technical support as needed um, with um, this particular sector as well to making sure that we um, are getting our kids transported in a safe, um, in a safe uh, method. And so as I close, I just want to um, close out and just indicate that mitigation stra uh, strategies are aligned with the CSCE guidance. We're working closely with the Department of Public Health um, to ensure and the CSCE to ensure safe reopening. Um, Public Health um, Department will continue to do uh, technical support and monitoring um, throughout the academic year. The vaccine mandate is now um, in place and will um, prevent any uh, vital infections in our schools and public health nurse assignments are in place as well. And so I just wanna thank you for your time and Madam Chair, I'm gonna yield the floor back to you and open it up for any questions that people may have. Thank you, Director Bond. Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Director Bond, that was very informative. I just have a couple questions that have been sent to me um, from the community. Um, one um, around the contact tracing with, um, so if there's, a, if there's a case in the classroom, how do you determine, because Delta variant is so contagious, does the whole classroom go out? Like, so people are wondering about that. So, you know, it's circumstantial. Um, right now, the CDC is recommending peer-to-peer, um, um, -peer, which is student-to-student. Um, there's not going to be, um, th there's going to be isolation if there's less than three feet. Um, so it will depend on the situation for sure. Um, if there's a teacher to a student, that situation will definitely be modified. And so we will work closely with the teacher. And that's why it's so vital that cohorting um, and, and seat assignments are in place because that will assist us with making sure that we isolate and quarantine in a timely fashion so that we um, are not exposing um any other children that need to be exposed. Okay, so um, and then with the with the with the mask mandate, uh, I'm just wondering how are we recommending to our community the best type of masks for the students? Because one thing that some parents don't realize, and what I see, you know, masks can be too big, right? And they're they're constantly sliding down so that the child is frustrated. Like I'm, I'm hoping that we talk about the proper type of mask that will help um, the kids to keep them up. Um, because that's, I, and I know there's no peer to peer, but I'm just concerned with the masks. Um, we need to t make sure that and talk about children have the proper mask with the proper fit. I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. I think I will work with, uh, we've done a lot of mask, um, illustrations and examples on um, promotional on the health side. And we can share that with Danny Diaz to send out to parents to make sure as they're preparing for schools um, on proper mask use and fit. And then um, are we, I, I, I haven't seen any like really big um, push to the community with the 12 and over students getting vaccinated. The district has been, has not been very vocal um, is there any way that the health department could help us to be a lot louder? Because I've been doing surveys within what, within my practice, pretty large practice, and none of the parents can recall any kind of um, like campaign from the district around vac vaccination. Um, so, so, so I'm not done. Who's so? I where is the saying. where where? Can you, are you assisting? I mean, we should be from the billboards. We should be screaming it and we're not. So how can we, how can we be more proactive around the vaccination push for the 12 and older? So we've done, um, in my previous slide, uh, we've done over a hundred specifically targeting youth. We just did the back, back to school rally. We were, we set up a clinic there. So- No, we, we no, not you. 
the board of ed people no this is in partnership with the board of ed they're not so, they're not receiving it like that so, so i you know what i'm saying i'm just saying we need to be, how can we i just want to know how we can be a little more proactive because we're we need to be a little bit more loud louder yeah and danny diaz also sends them out to all of the different um parents or through the i haven't gotten anything on on vaccination and really? i get all of this stuff yeah I, I could I could respond as well if that's all right with you, Madam Chair. Yeah, it's a conversation. So, we need to yeah. yeah. So for, first of all, I agree 100 percent, Dr. Jackson, that we need we need to do more. We need to keep keep doing a lot. Um, we are uh, putting up billboards and specifically um, uh, targeting young, popular people. I don't know who these people are, but the young people apparently do. And uh, Eric's worked on a video uh, with uh, young uh, oh, sports I saw players. It. You I saw, saw it. it. It's awesome, isn't it? It's amazing. And, and so, there are billboards also. The, the I don't know when they completed happens. it, but Eric just Eric just texted it to me um, today, and we're going to really push that out as well. And I think that it's a good suggestion, not only to do it through the city's resources, but to use NHPS resources as well to really promote that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to. I was just. I was going to also add. Um, and thank you also, Dr. Jask Jackson, because you've been an advocate. Um, for us as a pediatrician um, and an independent practice pediatrician at that. So thank you. Um, I don't know if everyone saw Dr. Jackson on the Route 34 <laughs> billboard, um, but we, along with our youth and um, through our athletic department, Dr. Jackson um, has taken the challenge and every challenge I normally throw at her last minute to support this effort and um, anything that, um, any suggestions that anyone has as a collective um, for certain we will um, incorporate. But as you know, we definitely want to um, are going to be tracking by schools and seeing what the vaccine rates are by the dis by schools so that we can try to continue this push because the more we get individuals vaccinated, the closer we can get to herd immunity. So we want to make sure. We and the last part, the last part of my question, um, Director Bond, are are we scheduling any vaccine clinics at the high schools? We have, um, we have definitely done that. Um, and we also will be working closely when school starts and having vaccines available on a daily basis. Okay, perfect. So, uh, actually vaccine clinics are scheduled in collaboration with all in-person orientations at the high schools uh, for this week upcoming. Uh, some of this information is being pushed out with the orientation packets as those go out to families as well about the opportunities to be vaccinated as well as when the when additional vaccination sites will be available. The vaccine, the, the orientation packets are thick and a lot of that stuff gets tossed. Maybe that should be like out of it. If there's like a flyer or something, not in it. We can get that out to folks. Thank you. Mr. Wilcox. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for the very informative uh, information, Director Bond. Uh, I have a couple quick, well, I have a couple questions here. One is um, the information you presented does talk about the, the, uh, the tracing efforts and so on. My question is about when uh, closing either whole schools or moving the district to remote instruction for some period of, of time. And I'm wondering if there's been discussions or planning for that. As you know, we did that, you know, we had to do that last year. We, 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 we were intending not to open until November. And then also it was in uh, the district in consultation with your office, didn't go to in-person until um, I guess it was February for some of the grades. So I'm just wondering what the process will be for whole schools or whole classrooms or wings of schools, et cetera. Yeah, so, you know, that's a good question. When we first closed uh, and had to make that tough decision collectively, um, we did not have um, any of the mitigation strategies in place. There was no infrastructure in really battling this pandemic. And so now we do. We have lots of ways that we can reduce the risk of exposure. We have lessons learned um, from, um, prior, um, th from the prior school year. And I think most importantly, I think what happened with us, I, I usually say we're like the gold standard in the New Haven district because we did not, no other district, I don't even know anyone else in the nation who requires school inspections, you know? So we took like the extra mile. So I always feel like we, we are a, a great example of um, being able to be successful. Um, and so I'm proud of that. And of course, um, there are no discussions around closures at this time. 
Um, but we know that if we we will be monitoring those cases closely and working collectively with the Board of Ed. Um, but um, I am proud to say that New Haven has been a leader um, in this effort um, with safe school reopening. All right, thank you very much for that. The next question I had was related to the governor's uh, vaccination order. And um, if teachers and other school staff and everybody know what the process is now for what they need to do in order to, to um, fit into the requirements of that. So as you know, that was just um, announced on the, on August, August 19th. And so okay. we, um, I believe I can defer to Dr. Tracy on this, but the, I'm gonna defer to Dr. Tracy to respond to that question. Okay, thank you, um, Director Barr. And thank you for that question, Matt. We are working. We're working and getting some information from attorney Mooney about certain things that we have. He's working on analyzing the details that surround that so that we can uh, make sure that we follow through with, it's crazy the way they put these exemptions and it's not very clear. So he's working with CAS, Connecticut Association of Superintendents to make sure all school districts are on the same page with what we message to the community. And that information will be coming to us shortly. And I did send some something to the board of some summation of what we believe it means. And then if when I get further details, I will also share with the board and the school community at large about our understanding of what needs to happen. It's gonna take um, a lot of work, uh, I think on our side, because the question comes up, to whom do we share or vaccine profile or information? Is it the school, Dr. Director Bonner? Is it gonna be through a VOC system? Is it gonna be through an app? In talking with Commissioner, um, Commissioner, Commissioner Russell, Russell Tucker at the state, she didn't mention that the state has some kind of apps and then school district could reach out to see how they can support us to make it much easier, not burdensome. On, on the schools themselves around tracking who is sending information, who does it go to. And one of the things I did mention that nurses should be very much at the forefront involved in this because you can't just take people's information and share nilly willy with everyone. So more to come on that. All right, I guess it is just a couple of days old. <laughs> the, the <executive laughs> order, so, um, uh, and you mentioned uh, the nurses and that was uh, related to my final question. Uh, the presentation director Bond mentioned that the public health nurses assignments are, are completed and you're making uh, all the various trainings and things like that in one of the uh, food service task force meetings. Um, the new, I'm blanking on the individual's name responsible for that, but seems extremely competent. Um, do you, are we gonna have less public health nurse or school nurses available than we did before all the pandemic and before the nursing shortage or, or how are we handling it? I, I do hear a lot of questions, people are concerned about it. And I'm wondering if there's even like a list of nurses by school or you know their nursing assignments, if that's public information. So right, yeah, so right now we're completing the acuity levels by school. And so we usually assign nurses based on their expertise to make sure that they have we have everyone properly um, allocated. Um, so uh, we are working through that as we speak. And as you know, um, nurse work the workforce overall for school nurses has been a challenge before the pandemic. Um, and so we're working closely uh, with um, HR and labor to addressing a long-term plan in regards to sustaining our workforce in regards to assessment of salaries, et cetera. And so that's under negotiation with the unions. Nevertheless, we are working closely with a temp agency to make sure that coverage is available, um, though that's not the best viable solution um, for those. Uh, we wanna make sure that we have a backup nurses available in case there isn't, um, if there's a, a nurse that happens to call out um, that day so that we can be able to provide coverage. So we are working closely to making sure that coverage is available and then also um, engaging the school-based health centers where there is a school-based health center at a local school to support. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Dr. Um, 
Dr. Bond, that was a very, um, very informative and helpful um, presentation, um, particularly around the nurses discussion, because I, I still hear people more concerned about that than anything else. Um, what, I, what I'm also hearing out there um, from parents, I just got a call from one today, who said, you know, what is the process for deciding when a classroom or school is shut down? Um, and um, how are parents notified about that and so on? Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. I asked that question a couple of times. Is there a threshold that we're using if a certain amount of kids in a classroom um, get sick or a certain amount of kids in a school get sick, we decide to close down? I mean, we're hearing about these you know, entire fifth grade in, in one school system, something like 5,000 kids were, um, were, were shut out of school because of an outbreak. So um, how can we get that, inf when can we get that information? I know it's, it's more of a case by case situation, but um, kind of a general idea because folks are afraid um, if they don't have the information, they're afraid to, to send their kids back to school. I mean, this person said, I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know if I could do it or not. Um, yeah, so, no, no. okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that's it. That's, no, I'm sorry, I want, I'll, I'll wait till you finish. No, no, I'm finished. No, I, I think you bring a valid concern. Parents want to make sure that their children are going to be safe. And if they're exposed, making sure they have proper notification. So internally, we make sure that as we, um, we work through any positive cases in a particular class, really having a clear understanding and a clear plan from the administrators per, by that school of where the children are engaging, the frequency of engagement, did it happen in the cafeteria, so that we can be able to properly notify who's those that are positive and those that are need to be quarantined and how to monitor those symptoms. So it is situational and it is difficult to say, will we, we, we will have, if we have to close the classroom, we will do it. I mean, I hope with all the mitigation strategies that we have, that we never have to close a school. I mean, a lot of the school closures that we see are extreme cases. Like I had um, an analysis done throughout the country. And when we see things that, to that extreme, mitigation strategies are just not in place. Um, they do not even have the proper protocols in place. And so um, we've met with the principals, we've refreshed and you know made sure that we discussed the new contact tracing um, guidance, which is actually reduced for this peer to peer. So making sure that proper notification is in place and will happen. And that will be led by Dr. White and Eric. So I don't know if Dr. White wants to add anything around contact tracing, um, but we will provide technical support from the health side if we have any concerns of any closure to that level and making sure that we're engaging with the administrators as necessary. As Director Bond said, we do this uh, in collaboration. We look at every situation and try to gather as much information. We've hired, uh, hired additional contact tracers so that we can get as much information. And one of the key factors always is making sure people are honest about their level of contact so that um, no one is getting in trouble because we've had situations where people didn't share everything because they were afraid they were going to get in trouble. We don't, we're not trying to get anyone in trouble. We want to know everything that we need to so that we can make sure the white people are out. And so that's the constant message. This is not a gotcha situation. This is about what were the things that happened? And if there was a failure in mitigation, that's something we can correct for the future, but we do need to know all the details so that we can make the proper decisions to keep our community safe. Thank, thank you for that. You know, um, as you know, we took a lot of flack um, last year when we insisted um, on these inspections and, and, these, um, and, um, and these mitigation um, um, activities being in place. And I'm, I'm so glad that we, um, that it's now being acknowledged that, you know, we're probably leading, as you said, the country now in terms of, of how we, how we, how we attack this, um, this virus. So um, I, I, I thank you for that. I have one other question um, for, um, I don't know if it's for you, it's probably for Dr. Um, Dr. Tracy. Um, I've been hearing um, over the last month or so that there has been, that there's, that there's a longer time than expected between a person's request, a, a teacher's request for um, ADA um, um, 
COVID reasonable accommodations and hearing back from um, from the HR department. So um, how is, is there a backlog? Is there a bottleneck? Is it just a normal process to for it to go for three to four weeks before a decision is made? Um, because folks are, are starting to get concerned. We're getting so close to school that they haven't heard back from your HR department um, regarding um, their request for ADA accommodations. Let me ask, thank you for the, the question and concern shared by committee members or staff. They, they, I'm not sure if they're referring to in the past when we were just trying to get a handle on AD accommodation, or is it now? It's now. Someone said they, they made a request early July and they still haven't heard back from the HR department. So is, is that the normal um, time frame that it takes to... It depends on how many requests they're getting in the HR department. And also that request may have come during the time of vacationing. And so it may have delayed some of those because summertime is summertime. And so that's that's what I'm gonna say about that piece. But I know that they do try to, to get to the doctors. They're not just accepting someone just saying that I need AD accommodation. They go through a process, how they have to apply for it and also verify with their doctors to make sure that someone is not like um, gaming the system. So they have to get proper documentation before they authorize the accommodation. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Tracy, uh, Dr. Jackson. Um, I haven't, so in the case of a quarantine, um, will, will those kids go to virtual? Like, how is that gonna work? So I remember I'd asked the question like a couple of meetings ago and because the state didn't require, we weren't kind of like keeping up with that. Is it like, how will that work now? Like if there's a, if someone's quarantined, do they, what, what is the virtual, what are we doing with that? What are those, what's happening with those kids? Uh, Dr. Jackson, we're providing uh, devices uh, for all of our students at the beginning of the year. Our, our teachers will be maintaining their Google Classrooms. Uh, we'll be having work posted and for the students and they have to complete a certain amount uh, and will be take, made as a remote present for the day. So they won't, so, so if they have, so if they're out on a quarantine, it's like 10 days, right? So is that 10 days of like just getting something that's posted or are they gonna be synchronous in the classroom? That's what I'm saying. Cause one of the questions I had asked was that we learned a lot over this year with um, virtual and how are we going to use that over the next, you know, it, cause we, where I'm hoping that we don't get any quarantines, but you know, I've been working in other situations and this Delta variant spreads very quickly. So if we had one and it's in the classroom, you know, the people are gonna get tested or they're gonna quarantine. That's, if I'm not mistaken, 10 days, correct? Director Bond, it'll be a 10 day quarantine. Part of those is gonna be, are they gonna just pick up work that's put up for them? Or are they gonna be having a virtual classroom where they're with their teacher? Are we using those skills that we acquired over the last year? That's. At this time, it would be asynchronous. Uh, instruction so they'd be receiving they would be things would be posted for them so they won't see a teacher for 10 days uh, I would I that would is what we have in place right now as we continue planning and looking and thing but that's what we have in place now okay why we learned how to do virtual teaching I mean it's I know it's I know it's August it's late but why do we not prepare for that? I had asked about that in the springtime more than once because I don't think that these kids should have to be 10, you know, have to not be synchronous. We learned how to do that. I'm hoping that yeah. we um, find a way to um, explore that. Um, I don't think that we should throw away what we learned, um, that skill, those skills over the last year and um, put kids to, getting posted work, that is utterly unacceptable for 10 days to have to pick up work that's posted. And this is not the first time that I've talked about this. We, I, I really think that um, 
we have the skill to not have to put kids in that situation. It hopefully won't be a lot, um, but 10 days is a long time. We're getting these kids back in the classroom. If someone has to quarantine at home, that's gonna be a big hit when we don't have to do it that way. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for the discussion. Okay, Dr. Tracy. Thank you, Director. I, I, okay. I just had one, one oh, quick thing. Ahead, Mayor, over. I just, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, Director Bond and also our building department and fire department for doing the inspections and for the work that our team is doing. And I also wanted to acknowledge something that we are not seeing in New Haven that we are seeing around the nation. And that is the incredible undermining of science and this mask battle that it, I, I believe is shameful that we are seeing in other places. And we have had none of that in New Haven. That makes me very proud to be mayor of this city. Amen. New Haven's the best. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Director Bond. Thank you good so much. Night. Director Bond can sign off, right? Yes, yes. She, already, she already did. She already did. <laughs> She's, She's like, wasting the time. <laughs> She's, I'm out of here. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure. I, I'm. I want. I could not recall whether or not we had presented the end of summer school summation to the board. For the board, Madam President. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Tracy. I just have one more question um, around that ADA um, um, issue I raised. Someone just sent me a copy of an email that was sent to them from the department saying that they're not processing ADAs until they get um, an, a, a new ADA or latest ADA, latest policy for ADA. What does that mean exactly? So let me have Ms. Mack, who is our HR director, answer that question, if she's on. Go ahead, Liz. You know what I'll do, um, Madam, Madam, Madam President? I'll just submit this question in writing to the superintendent and um, with what the rest of the board copied and she could just respond mm -hmm. to us. Um, Lisa's having some Thank technical you. problems right now. We could just move on. Get Thank, that you. Thank you. Thank you. So, sorry. So what I was saying, uh, Madam President, I am not, for some strange reason, I am not sure whether or not the summer school folks had given, after we closed summer school, if they had given an update of, you know, successes for summer school, I don't recall. So I put them on here to share just a few minutes, just not much about successes we've had, just verbally share some of the successes we have had in the varied summer school camps that we've, um, we've, we've um, done. Are and you, so- Are you gonna go into the pay equity? Um, and then I'm gonna reverse that. I'm gonna do that first, since okay. people may be waiting on here, okay. and then go back to pay equity, is that, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Yeah. So if I could have Miss Lisa Petra Simone, just a few minutes, just give a quick summation of how we ended summer school and lessons learned. Is Lisa on? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Quick few minutes. Good evening, Madam President, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Tracy, executive team and community, New Haven community. Um, I would just like to summarize some of our highlights of summer school since we um, had a, a month of learning and these are some of the highlights and positive things that have happened during that month. We actually had an enrollment of 1600 students, approximately 1600 students. That was our high enrollment. Um, and that came actually came to summer school, servicing K through seven and also pre-K. Those numbers do not include pre-K, but we did also service pre-K, K through seven in 12 buildings, grades five through seven in four buildings of those 12. And it was quite successful. We, I would like to highlight that 323 grade five through seven students attended the summer source STEM camp, which is 
unbelievable. It was had overwhelming attendance. So um, three things I would like to highlight. One, our positive parent responses to our survey for our learning celebrations and our learning program, our lit camp program. Um, the surveys were um, very positive as far as the type of curriculum that we presented every day and the engagement of our students. Also the success of our celebrity guests. This was definitely a win-win for our program. We have, what we did was little scientists and the arts and learning people came in with harps, drums, poetry readings. Our students were intrigued and loved every single time those and looked forward to the, those celebrity guests. A definite highlight. Um, the Lit Camp program itself, the curriculum, highly engaging literacy, uh, balanced literacy program, along with hands-on math. Every student had a kit with manipulatives. They were engaged in mathematics every single day. And I have to say, if we had to, uh, lessons learned, there's always lessons learned. Start early. Let's, look, let's look at our enrollment and see why we can't engage. There was 2,900 students actually registered and 1,600 came. So how can we engage those other students that did not attend? And what do we need to do to get them to attend? Okay. And so um, I would say that, oh, and for definitely our end of the end of summer school celebration with Dr. Tracy's fitness walks and also our field day was quite successful and engaging for our students. And I'd like to thank every single person that was involved with helping and uh, guiding um, Ms. Uh, Ivelisse Velasquez, thank you. And Dr. Tracy, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hannans, thank you. And uh, all of those who supported the summer program. I appreciate it. Hey, Dr. Thank, Weiss, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Gemma, I think I saw Gemma's head somewhere. Yes, <laughs> Gemma Joseph Lamkin. Just quickly, quickly um, say some things, the highlights of the summer program. She on mute. Gemma, you're on mute. Um, Gemma, could I ask Gemma, can you hear me? Oh, I'm oh I'm sorry. Could I because we didn't share this with the board in terms of presentation? Could you just give some just quick verbal highlights? Because we yes. did not share this document with the board. Okay, I, I sent it. I wasn't sure that she did not. Um, no, she, she did not get it over. into the package. Okay. Online, so I don't want to. Okay, hang on. I, want to I think I saw that. this in our package. It, no, not this one, no. <laughs> okay. So just just so, give some quick verbal highlights. Right. So I'm just going to try to um, talk through. So uh, we had a wonderful time doing our um, summer of fun programming. We had over um, 400 folks participating in those programs. Um, I was also um, very excited to participate in our um, superintendent's um, challenges. We had, again, several, um, several dozens, hundreds of folks participating in um, walking to the top of East Rock, uh, as well as on, in, on our, uh, um, the, Grand. Farmington, the Farmington now. Um, we also uh, enjoyed the field day, as Lisa Petrosimone pointed out. We also did a great deal of work on um, reaching out to about 960 students or so who have been substantially chronically absent. And that was the most serious part of making sure that we support our students and families. Okay, you done, G? I am. 
Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you to Gemma and Lisa. They've done a very, an extraordinary job, I must say, in putting things together with the team. It was a team effort. With Ms. our Tiffany. amazing team. Um, yes, the team effort. Engagement. Yeah, Mr. Carolina and all those, Danny yes. Diaz and, and such. And Danny and, and his team continue throughout the summer, the weekends to still provide activities. Right, and I yes. hope that we get a chance to come back and share some of that work with yes. us, with with, uh, with our board, because it was really okay. phenomenal. So. Ms. Jackson, quickly on um, ESY program. We've provided uh, to approximately 438 uh, students uh, extended school year services. Those are services that are provided to our students with disabilities based off of their um, IEP. Um, within that, uh, oh, 150 of those students were enrolled into our general program that Ms. Petra Simone uh, mentioned. Uh, we utilized theme-based units, 80 students, 80 of those students were in the pre-K program, 50 within the high school. Uh, we provided after-school programming for our students, most vulnerable students within our um, uh, program uh, within East Rock. And for the most part, we utilize themes throughout the year and uh, we've received a lot of positive feedback from our programming for the summer. Was that quick enough, Doc? Yes, that was quick enough. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Elevator speech, Ms. Um, Tracy Philpott. Yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm pro providing the um, share out for the summer school, high school credit retrieval programs. We had six sites this summer, which is an expansion of our traditional sites. Um, we served over 500 students. Um, I don't have Hill House's numbers included in that, but well over that. Um, our summer school courses were aligned to our curriculum standards and were taught by certified teachers in each of the content areas. And our credit retrieval program offered our students the opportunity to gain um, and engage in a successful academic experience. Um, giving them the additional time that many of our students needed to um, earn credits for their high school courses. Um, each of the high schools um, not only offered the um, core courses of math, science, English, history, world languages, um, many of the schools also assessed our students' needs and tailored uh, course offerings to improve um, the probability of their students meeting graduation <coughs> requirements um, and also becoming more engaged in their learning environment. Um, for example, our traditional summer school program at Metropolitan, um, we actually added a social emotional learning component this summer in which we had a dedicated teacher um, implemented social emotional breaks for students where she would um, go into classes for approximately 15 to 20 minute sessions and would have discussions um, with students based on a series of props that she used um, to help students talk about um, what the pandemic has done, you know, why they're in summer school, um, and just sort of to kind of get through and um, be more engaged in the program. Um, we had over 207 students that completed the program and 97% of them earned at least one credit. Um, Wilbur mm -hmm. Cross offered a course um, such as culinary skills, computer science, and music. And they also implemented a social emotional piece um, which developed community um, that had building um, trips such as rock climbing, they did kayaking, they did a trip to New York City and um, also to the New Haven Museum. Um, of the 162 students enrolled in their program, 96% of them passed their courses and earned a total of 338 credits um, with 13 of those students getting back on track um, to graduate with their original um, cohorts. Riverside had a program as well in which they did a blended um, a blend of restorative circles in their daily routines. And they um, included some community partners um, to have discussions with students such as Ignite Our Voice, Citywide Youth Coalition, um, to speak to their students and increase student engagement. They also um, included some field trips as well to the Love Tribe, which is a yoga and meditation space and a nature walk in Branford. Um, they had 26 students attend their program and 18 were able to earn um, their credits. Co-op um, did a program as well with 40 students um, who received one credit and 22 of them received two credits this summer. HSC had a program where 100% of their students earned credits and Hill House ran their cover, uh, credit recovery program. 
And at the end of the summer program, we held our annual um, summer school graduation, which we had 25 seniors participate in our graduation program, all earning credit and graduating on time with their class of 2021. So it was a very successful program. Um, we appreciate the support, um, everybody who participated in our programs and helped guide us through um, this unusual summer. Thank you so much. And I would like for those information to be put in writing. I saw Gemma had a PowerPoint and I would like for every program lead to have those so we can document and present to our board so that can be there as evidence of the work that has gone on in summer school. And we did meet with all the summer leads and talk about um, lessons learned and next steps as we move into probably planning again, starting now for next summer. So thank you so much for all the work that's been going on across the system. Let me now take this to the next piece, which is the pay equity info part-time cost analysis that we were asked to do. And now I ask our new acting CFO, Ms. Linda Hannans, to come on to talk about that. That's also in your packet. Ms. Hannans. We're bringing her back in. Thank you. I don't know how to get this thing off. Okay, should I begin? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, good evening again. Um, what is in your packet? Um, what we did was we got a lot of data on just staffing in general and who was where. So what we tried to do was we looked at the pay code that were the folks that were just um, working at, at the $12 per hour, and we isolated those folks. And we said, well, you know, where, where were they? Um, we had a hard time because of the fact that, you know, COVID last year, a lot of people that were not hired didn't come on. But, but what we ended up doing was that we, we pulled out the people that actually got a check last year at the rate of $12 an hour. And you know, it was interesting because the majority of the people were on special funds. Um, there was only one on general and that was because we didn't hire any part-timers last year on, on um, general funds. And then there were only six on the inter-district. So then what we did, we, we came up with the rate of the $12 per hour. And we said, um, this is what they had, you know, this is what they would have made or did make. Then we said, okay, fine, let's say now get those people and now give them a rate of $13 an hour. And what does that look like? So that's what the second column is. And then you could see across the chart, we said, if the rate is 1350, this is what they would, this is what it would cost us. If the rate was $14, this is what it would cost us. And then if, if we were giving them the rate of $15, this is what's, what, what, what cost us. And then you could see at the bottom of the chart, the hourly difference, the dollar, the dollar 50, the $2 and then up to the $3 per hour. Um, and then so you can see what the differences between the $13 and the, and the, um, the first rate, there would, would be a difference of 82,000. 82, if we only gave them the 50 cents um, raise, then it would be a cost of 78. And then the rate of $14 and what it costs. And then the final, if we gave them $15 an hour, that would be the rate. Are there any questions? Mr. Wilcox and then Mr. Bolton. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my question is this was, if I understood the memo and what you've said correctly, this mm -hmm. was using the people that made $12 an hour last yes. year. Yes. And because there wasn't a lot of use of part-time folks, 
using general funds, there's only one reflected here. I guess what I'm curious mm -hmm. about is what the more typical numbers would be or what the administration is projecting, like for instance, the school year we're starting up. Um, and if that's gonna be more than one uh, or a significant number more than one. Base, basically, I, I had wanted to get you something what, what basically what's happening is that because we haven't, we've just started hiring now, what, what we said we wanted to do was look at this again. Right now we're in the middle of closing out the year. So we tried to make sure that we got the board something. Um, but what we want to do is after we get the bulk of the staff on, we have what's called a recommendation for hire. So everybody has to give us a sheet. Who are you hiring? How much are they, you know, how, when are they going to work? and what are your total projections? Once we get that in from all the departments that are going to be hiring people, then we could get a better outlook on what it would actually cost. And we plan on doing the same thing again. We also have to, the list that we were provided was this uh, list with just tons of people on it. And what, what it could have been too, was that there were some people up there that never even worked. So what I had, you know, what we're recommending as well, which as soon as we get this ED001 report out of the way, then we could start looking at other stuff, is to look at that list. Once we get the bulk of the people that are coming in and we'll be starting, you know, in September, um, then we were going to, we would like to, what we're going to try to do is to run a list to take out all the people that never got paid, that never actually worked. And then we, you know, we're trying to build a database and right now we don't have that. So this is the best we could do based on what we had. We asked for anybody that had a code of 720 and we said, okay, good, that looks good. Let's look at what it would cost us. So maybe around like say later on, we'll be able to do that for, for more, you know, for additional staff once they get on board. This was a uh, very small sample because of COVID and like last year we didn't hire a lot of people. Okay. But at least uh, it gives us a, a chart on what the numbers are going to look like. And then we have to keep in mind too that not everybody works 19.5 hours. Some people only work 10, some work eight. Hours. So it was like a, a sample of just tons of people. Okay, so what I'm hearing this is preliminary analysis, but this is yes. at least something. Yes, because we were trying and, to see where they were. And then um, I I don't recall if you have been in the um, the last finance and operations meeting. We did another thing that that the that committee at least is interested in looking at is just also if there's any implications for the other pay rates. Mm -hmm. um, so if if uh, you know it those like the bumping up effect that if uh, we whatever the whatever the final proposal is from the administration, uh, just that it takes into account any of those implications. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, thank you, Lena. What I, what I do know, Matt, um, in terms of bumping up. So for example, we have the power professionals contractual part-time is that if their full-time powers work part-time, they're to get $14.50 $14 per hour. If we bump up the part-time powers up above that or at the same level, then you have to bump up the union powers. So that's one thing I it was explained to me also. Also, um, we're getting, as you're speaking, we're, I'm getting, I'm inundated with a lot of rec for hires and part-time folks as rec for hires as we're getting ready to start the school year. I just recently signed from just one department, almost 50 part-time powers on that from one department. So they're coming in as people are getting settled. And from the general funds budget, it will be what the schools send to us from their allocated general funds as part-timers. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, um, I think we got we have several times over the last two years um, these kind of reports. Um, you know, this one says they're 98. Another one said there was 148. Uh, the numbers go all over the place, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, 
um, the bottom line was really just about the same. You know, it was going to cost $50,000, $100,000, to provide raises um, to these people. We were always told we just can't do it. Uh, we just did a $78,000 raise tonight. And, um, and, and, it, and it, didn't, it didn't affect, it didn't throw the, the, the district in the disarray. It didn't change everybody else's salaries or nothing else. Um, uh, we do that all the time. And I, I'm just not quite sure. We got these numbers, but what are we supposed to do with them now? Uh, we're, we're being told that these numbers are probably not the best numbers. And after a close, after we do the close out, then we can get some more numbers. It's been, it's been 13 months since we first asked you to provide a. Um, and this is not on um, you, Miss Hannah. I'm, I'm directing this to the superintendent now. Um, that we um, that we ask for information to allow us to make uh, good decisions. And we still haven't gotten the information. We're being told this is preliminary and we couldn't make decisions based on this information. So when are we going to get the information, the final piece of paper that tells us how much it would cost for us to do the right thing and provide not even livable wages, but a little better wages for our part-timers who don't have a union don't have any protection that have to come here year after year and reapply for their jobs. And, and, and these people are in the classrooms with our kids. What, First what of all, we get that information, Madam President? I mean, Madam uh, Superintendent. Mr. Golson, first of all, part-timers do not apply for their job in that manner. Principals decide if they want part-timers to work in their buildings based on their budget and their needs. It's not something that central office sets and say, here we go, we're going to have 200 part-time workers. That's not how it works. It depends on the principals and the programs and their needs. And so that's why the numbers fluctuate. We cannot tell you a definite number. Today, it may be 400. Another time, it may be 200. It really depends on what principals decide to hire from their budget. That is not controlled by us. The only thing that I do is look at what they have asked for and sign off to say yay, nay. We Man, can I, go to the side. Oh, that's not so, true. Let, me, let me say to you, <laughs> I am true. not the one who does this. Part-timers are at wheel workers and we're trying to say, Miss Linda just presented, she said for last year, the last 21, 22 school year, we had only 98 part-time workers under special funds and one from general funds. And that's because of COVID situation. Now in the past, we may have more. So even though you may have been asking and asking and asking, I have to get the people who would provide that information to me. Uh, that's so what we've tried to do. Dr. Dr. Tracy, Dr. Tracy, there is no way that these principles are setting the agenda in the budget for part-timers. You provide them with a certain pot of money and they make decisions what they're gonna use the money with that money for. So if you gave them a pot that said you could do, you could, here's $75,000, you could, you could buy, you could buy part-timers for the school year, they're going to spend that. They don't come to you and say, I need a hundred thousand dollars, and you say, okay, whatever you want. You set the budget. And, and quite frankly, you know, it's been over a year. And we keep getting partial information. And I'm asking the question that the mayor asked at the last meeting. I'm asking the same question at this meeting. When are we going to get the final document that gives us an ideal of how much it's going to cost? I don't care if it's 98 or 148 or, or 100. We know it's anywhere between 90. 98 is not a reasonable number because we know COVID. So we know uh, over the last two or three years before COVID, you could average it out. You know how many part-timers you have and then figure out what the budget should be for them. And then how much it costs to actually, actually give them a little more money. But, but you're not doing that. You keep giving us this and then you tell us, but it's not all the information. So we'll be back to you. And then we'll be sitting here for another 13 months before we get another document. And then we'll hear excuses. It's the summertime. It's this and that. And we can't get the information to you. 
This is getting is really getting frustrating now. It really is because I would like to see a document. I don't care if you average out four years. I don't average out, I can't care if you average out five years. It can't be that difficult. Can we get that information? And when can we get it? So, so let me say this, Mr. Golson. You are one of the board members. You are one of the board members. You're one of yeah. seven. You're, you're, you're right, Superintendent. And, and when I ask for the information, yes. I don't get it. When the mayor asks for it, it comes the next meeting. So yeah, that you're right. I am one of the board members, but not I am true. not an equal board member. This information was provided because you asked for it. And we are trying to provide the information. Mm -hmm. We're doing our best to provide the needed information that was asked for. When we get, we cannot give you a number of part-time workers. When we get the recommendations from school, we're giving an idea of what it would look like. When we get the recommendations from schools and from the very departments about their part-time powers, we will have a better sense of that. We cannot use last year's number to give you that. We're using those who were paid up to June as part-timers. That's what Linda has done. And that's the best we have to give you at this point. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to read, raise a procedural uh, uh, issue. Uh, we have a really well-run uh, finance committee. And uh, uh, Ms. Hannon just said that we don't have a database. And the reason we don't have a database is because the, the CFO position, the CFO operation has been in chaos for quite a time. And uh, we've been reactive instead of proactive. She's trying to become proactive. I don't think you can really understand the problem unless you understand each individual building and the fact that they all have different needs and that what it looks like this year would be, might be very different than what it might look like next year, what it looked like the year before. And it seems to me that we would be more efficient and we'd have better governance as a board if we work through the committee process and let, uh, let the uh, finance committee work through these issues, uh, let us know what the status quo is at this point. But then there's another issue. We, we are a unionized community. And if I were a member of a union paying union dues and I had people advocating for raises for people who don't, are not members of unions and are not paying union dues, that would be a problem for me. And our first responsibility is to, is to the contractual obligations that we have with these folk. I also think it's a misrepresentation of part-time employees to paint them as poor people that don't make enough money because many of them are retired teachers. Many of them have retirement income from some, some, some other areas. And I would be the first person to say, let's give everybody a living wage, but we gotta be able to ask the right questions and we gotta give the staff the time to get those answers. And we would do better if we did it through the committee process and brought that to the board. That's why we have the committees. Thank you, Pastor Joyner. Dr. Jackson? I'm hoping we can get to some kind of recommendation, something we have been talking about this for a very long time. And I can tell you that um, I'm approached in almost every time I go to the grocery store, any Walgreens from um, part-time powers who actually say, thank you for bringing it up because we don't make a livable wage. And um, I don't know any of the retired educators that are doing that, but all the people I know are um, folks uh, managing households, you know, and they're not um, at the level of a retired educator. Um, they are, are, you know, paraprofessionals and it is very hard for them to uh, maintain um, housing in New Haven right now, that's very expensive. Um, so I'm really confused of how it's taking so long. Um, I recall Mayor Elliker saying, um, Dr. Tracy, we'll have this at the next meeting and we don't have it. So I would like to know what the process will be. Will it be going to, doc, to um, Mr. Wilcox to get us um, some answers or, but I think it would be good to know exactly what the process is and when we'll know something. Because um, I think that the part-time paraprofessionals have been watching this for over a year and we should have an answer for them um, with a, a livable wage because they don't have one. 
Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Mr. Goldson, and then Mayor Ellicott. Thank you, Madam President. Um, in response to my colleagues' comments, I, I, I'm not saying this stuff because I'm just pulling it out. Of, I'm pulling it out, out, out of clear blue sky. The fact is that they're coming to me. These paraprofessionals are coming to me and telling me that they, they, they have to make choices between um, being able to buy food and being able to pay their electric bill because of the wages that they're making. They're working two or three part-time jobs and not making ends meet. So th this is not something to, to, to suggest that for some reason I'm mischaracterizing these people. This is what they're telling me. Secondly, in, ter in terms of the committee process, we set up a special committee. There is a committee that is responsible for, for, for reviewing this. This committee was set up more than a year ago, more than a year ago. And, 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 I, and I said when the committee was set up that this was going to be the end result of it. And it was. I said it was a stall tactic. We weren't going to come to any conclusion and we have it after 13 months. I asked to be on that committee so I could help move it along. And I was denied the opportunity to sit on that committee. So yes, I am frustrated. I am getting more and more frustrated by what is going on here because it just doesn't make any sense. There's no excuse for 13 months and not having the information in front of us, no excuse. Even the mayor was frustrated last that the last meeting we had that we still had to have the information in front of us. And then we come to this meeting today after being told we would have it, and we still don't have the information. So I'm not quite sure what else can can a board member do. I mean, you you, you set up a special committee. I voted for it, even though I didn't believe it was going to be productive, and it wasn't. We've asked over and over again over the last six months where are we in this process and we've gotten really vague answers we're working on it then we got a product that was that was related to the contract to contract the employees who we are just voted on their contracts for which it wasn't even the issue that that raised committee in the first place it was the non-contractual part-timers and you know I, i'm just not i'm not sure what else am I supposed to do? I've sat, I've sat patiently over the last 13 months waiting for this, this special committee to come with a report. It hasn't. Uh, I've, I've, I, I just don't know what else I'm supposed to do. So, you know, and, and, and now I'm being told, well, you have to wait again and with no deadline set for how long I'm going to have to wait. I mean, I guess you run off the clock. I'm, I only have two years left, left on the board. So I, I assume um, two, two years, one day, there will be something that comes out, uh, but it certainly won't happen in my lifetime, apparently, even though I've been working on this issue for the last four years. Um, I, I hope to see some sort of conclusion while I'm still on this board, yay or nay, based on the facts and on the numbers, not on, uh, we don't, I mean, every time we defeat a proposal to give them raises is based on the fact that we don't have all the information. That's what you keep saying. We can't vote for this because we don't know what kind of effect it's going to have. And we don't have all the information. And, and, and it's a self, it's like a, a, a vicious circle. We don't have the information and we're not giving you the information. So you can't never make the decision. So I've, I've, I've had my say. I hope one day in the near future, I will actually see numbers that we can make decisions on. Yay or nay. Thank you, Madam President. Mayor Ellicott and then Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just to confirm a couple of things. Uh, how many union employees get paid less than $15 an hour? Does anyone know that, Dr. Tracy or Ms. Hannons? The, the paraprofessionals and their contract, their, their um, if they're working part time, they they get the they get fourteen fifty, I think it is. But but that, those are the part those are part time. Those are the union people get if they work part time, they get fourteen dollars and fifty cent. That's in their contract. Okay, so they're pretty close to fifteen. Yes. Yes. Do you do you know how many are part time? I don't have that, and um, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I don't okay. have I'm that. Just, just looking for ballparks here. But I didn't print that before I left the office. How many paras in all do we have? 400. 
400 yeah. plus. 400, 400 do you have an idea of kind of, is it 20% that are part-time or? We had, what I basically did was unfortunately, I, I concentrated on the people that were not in a union and I used the code 720, which were all of the people that did not belong to a union. Mm -hmm. I can prop. I can. And I that's can, where you came up with the, the ninety-eight, data, right? So I can run yeah. that. Yeah. Are there other unionized employees that are paid less than fifteen dollars an hour? Yes. Who? So which um, there? I know that um, there are some. Let me go back into Linda in your union three one four four. No, they can't work. No, it, it, most it with the school. most of the unions, it's considered with three one four four. It's considered overtime. So it's whatever the person's rate is, plus an um, straight time and then time and a half. I'm trying to get a sense. Oh. If we voted on a minimum wage for the Board of Education that was $15 an hour, what's the financial impact? Mm -hmm. And so okay. it's, the, the, it's the part, the, looking at your math here, the part-time employees, and this isn't just parents, right? The 98 is other part-time employees as no, well. No, the, 90, the 98 is just the, the, those people that were making $12 an hour. That are well, not part of any union, but but they're they're not they are they are not just parents. They're we just call them, um, we we consider them we call them parent um, parent workers. We call them part time powers for just the sake yeah. of calling them part time powers. Some of them work one to one with special education um, mm -hmm. students, so it it has to be separated from the regular union powers who right. we have working part time and their part time powers. So mm -hmm. it's just a name and classification Correct. that we give them to say they're part-time. But mm -hmm. see, these are only paras, these are not other employees. No, no, these are just folks that did not fit into it, uh, any of the union classifications that the schools hire. Are there other part-time employees that are not paras that are paid that less are than not in, an hour? That are not in the code 720, yes. Who are they? Um, they were basically, um, who else did we have out there? They they um they have like what's called a skilled worker. So if they had a degree, they, there was a rate for those folks as well. Um, what is that? What is, what does a skilled worker do? A skilled worker is something like say if you have someone that's working at the school, but it it requires a little bit more than a than a uh, a regular um, parent worker, so to speak. So like say. Um, when I recall, it used to be like, say, if you had a, um, like, say, a sewing person, someone that's teaching a sewing, where that that might have had a skill. So we they they got a little bit more. But they're not getting fifteen. Not not these powers. The, these folks were only getting the twelve dollars an hour, and that goes back way back as far as I can remember. That you know how they, many of those uh, folks there are? The seven twenty. Do you know how many of the folks I don't are the have, I'm workers sorry, I, I, I apologize, but I don't have the list in front of me. I just concentrated on trying to get this in some kind of order. So I don't have the list of the names in front of me. Mm -hmm. I would have to try to get into my computer and try to run that. Um, so, so but I can probably do that tomorrow and get, get, get that out. It's like it so, was a massive list with all of these different classifications. So the list we had, Linda, was um, showed 1,571 individuals right. that we had. Mm -hmm. We it, it depends on whether or not some of those were deactivated or they're still working as powers right. for the system because right. it's not like they come back every year. Right. It's not like principals hire them back every year mm -hmm. or you know people within the district hire back the same individuals every year. That's mm -hmm. not how it goes. But I know right. on that list was about 1,571 right. considered part-time. And that, that is one of my goals. Yeah, and that I, I must say is was one of my goals when I was looking at the data. I said the first thing we need to do once we get all of the recs for hires from the various schools and uh, programs. One of my first one of our first goals is to then after we get all the people in, go in and deactivate anybody that um, is not going to be picked up. We can't deactivate them right now because what would happen is that we'd be taking out people that may be picked to work in another school. So we need to be careful as to who we are deactivating. We're just trying and to get an idea. We're just trying to get an idea. I mean, this, 
budgets are just about getting a, an estimate of the impact, not right. getting an exact number. We're right. just trying to get an idea here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that your team can probably come up with a good idea of what it would look like mm -hmm. to bring workers part-time and full-time to a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Right, we did, it, we did it for 14 or 13. So you're, you, and just to be clear, so you're saying that if we, for the 98 part-time paraprofessionals, right. mm -hmm. your estimate, well, you can't be sure of the exact numbers, your estimate is it would cost an additional $164,000 a year? If we gave them the 15, and that was just for the 98. So then um, I see what you're saying too. So even if we made it, uh, say, say we made it 200, then we could do it across the board. So we can probably give you something on, what it would cost using this is like, because now we have a guide and a base and we look and, and I can look at and say, okay, this is what it would cost for these 98 people. If they were making $12 an hour, what it would cost. So I think now I, I have something to use um, because right now in the budget, we don't, we don't budget part-time. The schools tell us what they need. And then based on that, then they decide, well, they want to take, like, say, if each school got twenty-five thousand dollars, and I'm just that's a small amount. And then you say, okay, fine. What do you want to do with this twenty-five? They tell us how many they can hire. They then they cost it out, and then we say yes or no. You know, this you can do this. Yeah, but you can, get, this you can get an idea, right? You can look at how many paras and other part-time workers you've had for the last several years, or and, and and get an estimate of what it would look like for this year and how much it would cost. We could, but the but like I was saying, the list hasn't been cleaned up in so long that when we ran the list, it, we could. I guess we would have to have Michael run us a list that shows us anybody that's active. And You've been some, working. And, and and unfortunately, what happens with the list? Some people will work like some people would just work a season. So say you had extended day, where extended days would start from like say January and then it stops in April. Some schools will have extended day and they'll just have uh, uh, um, uh, that February recess. So it, when we were looking at the list, it was like there were so many variables in that list. And I'm not trying to make excuses, but you know this was my first attempt looking at the list and there were a lot of variables in that list that need to be weeded out. So I said, okay, fine, to get something to the board, let's just take everybody that is seven, code 720, which means you make $12 an hour. And that's, the, and that's why, what, where this spreadsheet came from. Useful. This has been on the finance agenda. It was on that the last meeting. It's it's mm -hmm. going to remain on the agenda. I think it should go through the finance committee. I don't think that this was presented at the finance committee to, to bring it to, to the board. So I mm -hmm. think if we can hash some of this stuff out in the committee first and then bring it to the board, it would probably be a little more worked out. I appreciate that, Madam President. It. <laughs> and and I also know Ms. Hannon, this is your first your first yes. hour hour on the job, is it? Yes. Yes. No, I officially don't start till team. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, but uh, even though my face may not convey it, I'm really really frustrated with this. Uh, <laughs> like, how many times do we have to talk about it? And I, you know, I'm not going to go on, but mm -hmm. we got to get an estimate an Great. estimate of how much it will cost, in my view, to bring people to $15 an hour across the board, full-time, part-time, how much is it gonna cost us per year? And it, and it, just give us a range. Is it 15, is it $1.5 million to $2 million? Just give us a range. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see other people have their hand up, so I'll, I'll see the floor. Thank you, Mayor Alecker. Ms. Hannons. Um, Mr. Wilcox, because I'm thinking you're going to talk about finance committee. Uh, no, go ahead and go with the other folks first, please. Okay. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Joyner. Yes, oh, um, I was, I just, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you called Dr. Jackson first. No problem. Want me to go? 
Yeah, okay. absolutely. Oh, okay, okay. So you I was just I was English. I was trying to do some clarification because I was getting um I was getting some clarifications when you guys were speaking. And one of the paras was saying she is one of the part-time paras, I think that Dr. Tracy was referring to that's kind of not in any kind of category, but they put her in a para, but she's $12 an hour. She has mm -hmm. no benefits and she's $12 an hour. But her thing is that every year she has to reapply for her job. So right. school starts Friday and she won't hear until, and, and I won't start till my application goes through. So I won't start till maybe after Labor Day. So that's mm -hmm. not working again till after Labor Day and they get no holidays, no vacation, no benefits, no nothing. So the $12 an hour is literally, Twelve dollars an hour with like nothing, nothing else. Um, and then another clarification came through that said the part-time retired teachers get paid at the teacher rate, which is far higher than Paris. So those were the clarifications I wanted to add to the conversation. And I support the mayor in asking, in that I am frustrated, and let's 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 kind of come up with something. Mm -hmm. Get this and. Dr. Jackson, Dr. Joyner? Yeah, I'm frustrated too, but for different reasons. There's a level of complexity here that we have to understand before we can even know the right questions to ask. Now, if you wanna, if you wanna decide that you have X number of people working at X number of places and you want them all to get $15 an hour, that's not hard to do. But the reason that people are not called back when school starts is because principals are trying to decide what their priorities are. And, and, and it may be that a person they used last year might not be the right person for this year, particularly given that we're in a COVID situation. Or it also may mean that the person they used last year did not rise to the level of, of, of competency that I'm, I'm speaking for myself now, based on my experience as a principal and working with other principles. Um, so I don't think we should rush this. And, and, and the reason that we have had issues in the past is because we, we've had a, a chaotic situation in that department. And uh, again, we, we, if we need to meet our union contractual obligations first. And then we need to determine what the staffing would look like in schools based on the uh, nuances of each school or we could come up with another model, which is sounds like what the mayor would like to know. Mm -hmm. If we had X number of people working in X number of schools at this rate, how much would they make? It still wouldn't present the true picture. It would give us something. And then of course, the other question is, you know, is always how you pay for it. And, um, and I think that, you know, being on this board is very complex. And uh, it's better for us to try to get at the real bottom of things and make decisions than it is for us to be harried uh, and what have you. Because, you know, this, this has been a problem no matter who the president has been. Uh, I do think things have gotten a lot better in finance since Matt has been in charge, but he doesn't like taking vows, but I'll give him that anyway. And uh, if, if you only knew uh, the nuances at the school level, then you might have a little bit more uh, patience for this. And the fact that Linda is not even working yet, but clearly she has more answers and knows more about the inner operations of the district than anybody I've heard from in a long time uh, in this business and in, in, in that position. So let's try let's try to temper our frustration as best we can. Madam President, yeah. You're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I do just wanna say this has been on the agenda for the Finance and Operations Committee. It was on the last meeting where we're clarifying questions that are going to the district so that they can be answered in an organized fashion. Uh, I will extend the invitation yet again on any finance and operations um, item or anything related to the finance and operations that if any board member or members of the public want to send to Dr. Tracy and to the members of the committee, we actually put the stuff on the agenda and we do discuss it. So um, 
if the will of the board is that this all this happens in this meeting, then you can save us a little bit of time and we won't add it on the agenda, but then we can just add working through all the details of this. Uh, and that would be fine with me as well, but I, I, I would like to know that ahead of time so we can save committee time. Um, in the meantime, we if you have questions, please let me know. And in the meantime, just as a reminder, the $12 an hour folks, Connecticut minimum wage went up to $13 an hour on August 1st. It goes up to $14 an hour on July 1st of next year. And then finally 15 on June 1st, I believe of the following year. So we will have some movement in these things. And I'm also certainly hope that we are encouraging these part-time folks to apply for the full-time union para position jobs with all the protections that are part of being part of a bargaining unit and that I'm also hoping just like we do you know across the board helping people move onward and upward with their careers just like we are with our students having them move towards some other goals as well and I understand that that's not going to work for everybody and I am fully supportive of increasing pay even though we didn't get the full request from the mayor's budget or from the alders. In the end, I'm still fully supportive. I just want us also to make sure that we can um, make it work and that we're not diminishing what the services that the schools can bring and that we can prioritize this funding. I do agree that a living wage or more of a living wage should be the goal of anybody on any board of any commission. And so that's, I'm fully supportive of that. So if there's these specific questions, we are asking specific questions in the Finance and Operations Committee, and I wanna make sure that we get those answers. So I've been taking some notes and this will be on the agenda for the next meeting. Thank you. And if I could just interject something, if I may. And, and what I wanted to say was, as I was looking at this, the, the history of this stuff, I'm noticing that the bulk of the part-time people are now coming on the grants. That's where we saw the bulk of the grants, the, the money coming from, which is the one, you know, the 1.2 at the end of the day. Um, so this chart also shows us where the dollars are. And, you know, we're living in good times right now because we, we you know, we have grants that are giving us dollars. Now, once we start, you know, with the with the rate, and believe me, I you know I have no qualms against you know, the, the rate because it's been twelve dollars for so long. But we have to make keep in mind too that as we start increasing these rates on the grants, that's going to be um, what I say less opportunity for more powers to be coming in because the, the the schools would now be stuck with you know starting the starting rate of the fifteen dollars per hour. And normally, what we do is. The, the schools tell us based on the rate, what type of staff they want to hire and how many they can get based on the rate and the dollar amount. I just want to make sure that we that we see that. Ms. Hammonds, are, are you saying that it's a possibility that the principals won't be able to hire as many parents as they would want? If they well, based, on, based on the rate, but I do have to say in fairness and I, you know, they, the rate has not been increased in a long time. So yes, they, they, but they would have to hire based on the dollar amount that, that they have. So like say the bulk, what I saw in the trend was that the bulk of the part-time people are coming in on the grant side. But what happens when they're coming on the, in the, on the grants, um, the, we have to, because it's grant funded, we have to pay this uh, the 7.65% for the FICA and the Medicare, plus we have to pay for the workers' comp. So on top of these dollars, we then have to add additional funds because we have to pay the FICA and Medicare. They don't, we don't get that free and the department is charged for that. And then we also have to pay for workers' comp if they get, you know, if they get hurt on the job as well. And any um, co other compensation that goes with the cost of doing the business of paying these people or any staff for that matter. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Tracy. So I, I want to make it clear to probably those who are listening and to workers who have been working in the system. I'm not here, the superintendent, fighting against uh, you know, pay rate for individuals. Mm -hmm. 
but I have to listen to the finance department and what's going on. I am sure if I present a budget that's, that's, that's outside of what the budget should be, I'm also going to be held accountable. And I'm going to be told, I'm sure, you didn't balance your budget, you didn't do this. I'm sure when it comes to grants and the grants um, allocation are diminished. So now how do you pay that? That is why principals hire and, and department heads hire people on a yearly basis. I may have you this year, I may not have you next year. It's not a permanent job. That's why it's called a part-time job. And with the system that we run, it's very complex. Some work 12 hours, some work 15 hours, some work, work 19.5 hours. So it's, it's not an easy thing to get and say a blanket across the board. Here it is. There are different hours that different people work. The skilled workers that we talk about get 15 per hour because they have some of them have a degree. And so they're paid more according to the pay scale that was set up. I didn't set that pay scale, just came into this position. I'm doing what? has been there. Now the board wants to change that. It's up to the purview of the board. You can rank and to say, well, Dr. Tracy, whatever the complications you have or complex situation, we're going to raise the pay to 15 across the board. Then be that as it may, it's in your hands. I'm not going to argue anything, but at the same time, we have to know how will it be paid for? Because rather than having two powers or part-time workers and principal may go down or, you know, to one, so we have to weigh the consequences of what we're doing. I am not here advocating for not raising pay rates for our part-time people or our power professionals. I just want to make that clear. But yet I know I want to be held fiscally responsible for what happens. Come here, come here, girl. Come here, girl, come here. Mayor Elfair and then Dr. Jackson and Mr. Bolton. Uh, Dr. Tracy, I think that's that's the whole reason we're having this conversation. Otherwise, we would have moved earlier on to yeah. have a fifteen dollar minimum wage across the board. Yeah. We're trying to get the accurate information so that we don't put ourselves in a situation where we can't pay for something that we're supporting. That's why we want the information. Um, I, I just, I, I, Mr. Wilcox, I'm I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite understand. So the finance committee is reviewing this and. Uh, on an ongoing basis. I, I'm sorry that I didn't quite understand what you were saying. Um, yes, it's been on the agenda. We've had discussions about it, clarifying just uh, specifically the questions of what would the implications be of the New Haven Board of Education setting a policy that minimum wage would be Connecticut minimum wage plus 50 cents and or Connecticut wage um, plus a dollar. We asked specifically for that information and because uh, that would be a policy way of addressing this that would also adjust along with Connecticut minimum wage as opposed to just setting an, uh, the number at 15 because then in a couple of years it'll catch up, we'll catch up, Connecticut minimum wage will catch up to what we would be having. So this would be a policy way of having uh, that premium built in for New Haven public schools uh, but it was on the last agenda. Our agendas are posted. It's on the next, it will be on the next agenda as people will see. And if people have specific questions they want, please send it to the committee and to Dr. Tracy. That's part of what we do is get answers to those questions. We're gonna keep this on there and move it to a resolution uh, to, to solve this in spite of what some might think. That's uh, actually my full intention. And it's been the intention stated in many finance and operations meetings and many board meetings. Just wanna to try to do it in a good governance way um, as been advised that we should be doing and uh, trying to get that done. So again, if you have specific questions, please let us know. Well, well, Mr. Mr. Wilcox, I think we, we, we all understand what the goal is here. And, and, I, and I understand that in an ideal world, we'd all show up at the finance committee and, and do a lot of questions, but you're, it sounds like you're, you're working on this hard, which is really great. And you've requested this information recently. And have you been, for, it sounds like you have not yet been provided this information. Well, we have information that we're provided tonight. So, which is what we talked about in the last meeting. We've been without a CFO. We just now have an interim CFO. We were told that some of the problems were with staff on vacations after the summer school. 
staff are back from vacations. We now have a CFO interim that's starting tomorrow. So we already have information tonight. We have more information tonight than we did last time. Last uh, finance and operations meeting, I trust we're gonna have more information at the next finance and operations meeting as our great intelligence staff are listening to the discussion and the questions that we have so they can pull this data together so we don't have to spend 45 minutes in a meeting uh, discussing it. We can spend the time in the finance and operations meeting where we can then get the questions answered for this full board meeting. Just, Mr. Wilcox, you sound very frustrated with the dialogue here. I, and I'm, I'm sorry that I, I, I didn't mean to sound, I apologize for sounding frustrated. It's just that, that we, we um, as we've been saying, these are questions that we do try to operate in the committee that the board has set up to handle these questions. I'm sorry if we're not moving at the speed, which uh, some Matt, think you don't have to, be to doing. apologize for sounding frustrated. It's frustrating. Well, it's just a little frustrating. We've spent more on this than we did on the health Absolutely. issues for an entire school Absolutely. district tonight in a public right. meeting right. where um, where we're getting into the nuts and bolts and details of FICA this and percentages of that. I, you know, I think staff have a sense of the importance of this. I think the public now has a good sense of the importance of this. I certainly have a sense of the importance of this. I certainly want to move things forward. Um, I would love to have an answer to this question by the end of September. And if that's not good enough, then um, I'm sorry. But that's what my goal is to move forward. That's my personal goal. But of course, I don't run the world. I just ask the questions in the meeting. All right, let's let's move. On. Let's move on. Madam Chair, you 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 muted, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm mute, Madam All Chair. Right. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox, Mayor Alliker, Dr. Jackson. Um, I, I'm I, what I was going. I'm changing what I had to say, but I I'm going to say this that. We have to be very careful in when we discuss this around, you know, people have these jobs, that's their job. You know, wh whether they applied somewhere else or not, that's their job. And we can't look at it and say, well, you should apply to get a higher paying job. Like some of the comments tonight have been um, extremely hurtful for me to hear. I know no one on here has ever made $15 an hour or $12 an hour. So when we're discussing this, we'd be very mindful to understand that, you know, people have a job, that's their job. And, and we're here to, to have the discussion, to come up with the final solution, but not to um, blame somebody for having a $12 job. Like they need to apply to get a, a job that pays more. Or, you know, I'm not against raising a salary, but you're not really advocating. So we have to be very careful about this and understand that, you know, it is going to finance and whoever is going to be doing all of this, make sure that it gets done. Uh, we have been waiting on this for months and it, it's kind of a, it's a little weird that, you know, we can't figure this out. Um, the people who are working 19 hours or less are making $12 flat. $12 flat. So well, I don't know how that works, what we're going to do. It needs to go higher, how we do that. That's for Mr. Wilcox and whoever else to figure this out. And when you do figure it out, I'm going to vote for that. But we need to be very careful of how we discuss this. And, you know, we don't blame people for having a $12 an hour job ever. Um, so I'm looking forward to moving this forward. Um, this is very important. That's all I have to say. Last thing. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Mr. Goldson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I've been blessed um, not to be stuck in a $12, $13, $15 an hour job. Um, I, I used to work for a um, shelter back in my early 20s. And the, the, the director of the shelter used to say to us all the time, we were only one or two, so many of us was only one or two paychecks away from living in a shelter. You know, you, you, never, you never know um, what, what, what your circumstances, where your circumstances are going to bring you. And you always try to have a special place in your heart for those people who are not where you are. Um, and that's why I advocate for this. And, you know, um, 
I don't understand why anybody would be frustrated that we're bringing this issue up now because this board set a committee 13 months ago to, to do this work, 13 months ago. So how much time is enough? Quite frankly, how much time is enough? And um, it's frustrating to me when people come to me in the grocery store and when they come to me other places and thank me uh, for, for fighting on this issue and then remind me of how important it is to them. How that one dollar or that two dollars can really make a difference in their lives. It's not going to take them out of poverty, but it sure would make poverty a little less hurtful. Um, so, you know, we tonight we tonight we approved a a salary change of seventy eight thousand dollars. Didn't blink an eye. We were getting ready to approve. A, a sabbatical for a person without having an idea of how much it cost us, didn't worry about where the money was coming from and how it was going to affect our bottom line. And when we learned how much it was, around $85,000, we barely blinked an eye and we still voted for it. But somehow when we talk about 100 and 150 or so employees at 50, 50 cents, a dollar raise, somehow we get frozen in place and get stuck on all these semantics about how it's going to affect the bottom line. We don't ever talk about how it affects the bottom line when an administrator gets a raise or when we hire another administrator or when we change our budget or when we do a reorg that adds administrators to the budget. Uh, we, we don't blink an eye. And so, yeah, if people are frustrated, that's what they should be frustrated about is the fact that we have set our priorities so that the lowest paid of our employees are not a priority at all. And we can continue to say over and over and over again, they are a priority and we really want to help them. But if we don't help them, then we're just blowing a whole lot of hot air. Whole lot of hot air. So 13 months for me is more than enough time. More than enough time to come to, to, come to some sort of conclusion. We're not rushing this. It's been 13 months. I'm going to keep reminding you, 13 months, over a year. We're not rushing this process. Please, please do the right thing. Get us the information so that we can make a decision. Let's change our priorities so we have one or two less administrators and we pay 100 people, 150 people, an extra dollar or two. Thank you, Madam President. No further discussion. We'll move on to the Head Start report. Mr. Wilcox. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Head Start report. Okay. We met uh, August 19th. A couple things the board need to be aware of. Uh, we have the focus area two review, which is a review from the Head Start. Uh, regional office. Uh, it's going to be heavy with um, data examination and things like that. We've been notified that that is coming in October, and then they're going to send us the official dates, the exact dates, uh, and that's coming up. That's going to be a huge thing for the district to pull together. Uh, so, but that's um, one thing that everybody should know about. We still have lots of spaces available for um, Head Start enrollment spots. One good thing with the enrollment this year in with all the different pushes that they're having is that we were able to use some of the carryover funds to hire some folks, part-time folks to um, do help with the enrollment, get the information uh, from a paper-based system into the computers so that they can assist folks that don't have easy access to a computer or are just accessing things on their phone. So there are people that'll, they'll, go and meet folks and, and get the information done. And they're also working on getting all the health records in place, which is also a requirement that we have and something that the district struggled with during COVID. So those things are some things that I just wanted to update the board on. Um, Ms. Durwin is on top of things related to that focus area review. So hopefully everything's gonna go smoothly and I know the rest of the administration will be helping her as needed. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Um, 
hearing no other questions, if you'd like, I'll move on to the Citywide School Building Committee. Yes, please. I'll be very brief. We did meet on Thursday, August 12th. The information that was presented in the stewardship is, was posted, is posted on the website, which goes through all the major projects. Uh, as typical, I invite everybody to take a look at that and see some of the major things that are happening in relation to that. Some of the things that were discussed was new ways of handling work orders that sound extremely promising. Mr. Lamb and um, various other people involved in this are working hard on maximizing use of our work order system and solving, uh, I'm sure we've all heard complaints over the years and it sounds like things are in place, which is also gonna include sign off on the work and um, a lot of being able to have analysis of where the work orders are, which could help drive um, other types of maintenance requests. So that sounds like some really promising things. Uh, that are happening as far as that goes. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. So, okay. all right, move on to the finance and operations report. In addition to the part-time pay update, we're going to continue on with that. I appreciate the uh, kind words and um, uh, from my colleagues on what we need to be doing. So I am going to be working towards helping us make sure we do that. Um, but in addition to that, we're also taking a look at the, well, the work order tracking was talked about in that meeting as well. And we're probably going to be looking at monthly or quarterly updates on that. So we can kind of see a um, top level view of what buildings have issues and, and so on. Uh, and then the other major thing is that we're Continuing, and we will continue our next meeting, uh, taking a look at the after school program, the processes, the um, different things related to requirements, forms, deadlines, uh, report detailing how the programs are distributed by school and by the funding sources. And uh, we also had dis made some discussions about before school programs and what we can do as far as that goes. So um, happy to answer any questions related to that. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Thank you. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the governance report, Dr. Jackson. Hello, everyone. Welcome to governance. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just going to go over the first reads, and then I have a wonderful presentation that um, will be happening quickly. So you have a first reading for alternative school policy, 6172. Please read that. Um, just to let you know, within that policy, we're working on also touching on the um, the homebound um, as a part of the alternative school as as a as a type of alternative school link policy within that, and also um, the we're also going to be working on kind of what I touched on before. Um, using virtual, um, like a virtual um, learning as part of our alternative school policy, um, specifically around when, um, like when there's a, a quarantine or like where there's a kid who may be out, but not out because of an ailment that doesn't allow the child to participate, something like, you know, so that, is gonna be part of that, but it is here for a first read. Um, and then we also have a first read, first reading for the transgender non-conforming policy. This policy um, comes before you after a lot of work um, and the folks that worked on that, um, I'm so very proud of them. Um, and they came to the meetings, they participated, they worked outside of the meetings, so please, um, read this, offer any suggestions or any questions, please come back to me for that. Now, um, Mr. Lamb and crew will be doing a, a presentation and I asked them to come to speak on the air quality policies and facilities because we thought it was very important and it would be great for them to speak today right before we go back to school and parents can hear about um, what they're doing with the air quality since that was a question and Madam Chair had asked me months ago to make sure that this was a focus 
um, this policy. So here we are, Madam Chair, and, and I just have to commend Mr. Lamb and his crew. They've really worked really hard and have some great um, stuff packed in here for, for there. Cool. You're on. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson, uh, members of the board. Um, so over the last several months, um, one of my key uh, items that I have been concentrating on since I began with the district was evaluating uh, how we are managing our indoor air quality because it's, it's a very important um, to the district. It's important to our students. It's important to our staff. Um, and it's also a, a very key component to the health of our buildings. Um, the, uh, I'm just gonna pull up a brief presentation. Sorry, wrong one. Okay. So uh, the indoor air quality, um, it, it, throughout my career, I have worked uh, in, predominantly in healthcare and indoor air quality is a, is a very strong component um, within the facilities uh, program that manages um, healthcare buildings. And there are a lot of similarities with um, how we operate our facilities uh, currently th through COVID and how healthcare has uh, historically managed their facilities um, through best practice development. Um, so what I have done with our facilities department um, is really start to, since I began with the district, was to look at uh, how we are um, effectively uh, managing the components of what would be considered a, a strong uh, indoor air quality program. Um, and it really starts with um, the management structure and how we are um, inspecting and reinspecting our buildings <coughs> and our processes to make sure that um, all of the, the components, other components of our um, program are, are operating effectively. Um, so the HVAC function component of, of uh, an indoor air quality program is probably the most important um, outside of um, the ability to, to inspect and reinspect. And um, going through and looking at all of the reports from Frust and O'Neill and with the, the, the work orders that have been placed over the last several years, um, along with um, the school Department of Health inspections from last year, um, I, I was able to kind of look at um, what uh, were the major drivers in uh, our systems not functioning to their full capacity and start to reprioritize um, those issues with our facility staff to get them completed. Um, the number one issue being our, our, our filter replacement and inspection, wanted to put them on some kind of a, a documented schedule. Uh, there's a saying in healthcare, if it ain't documented, it ain't, it ain't done. And I, I truly believe that with, uh, with the facilities team, we've created some processes in place and put them in place um, within the last month that will really, um, prevent a lot of the issues that we've had in the past um, with some photo documentation um, and inspections by not only our staff, but other, other, other members of the district, including um, the, the principals, principal and principal leaders that are doing some of the, um, the inspections around the school, schools um, with the, the facilities team. Um, and then exhaust fans, um, how our systems uh, operate uh, is greatly impacted by whether or not we're capturing uh, how our, well our systems are, are really functioning. And exhaust fan uh, inspections was one of the things that came out of the Fuss and O'Neill report that I really wanted to focus on to make sure that those were, were operating correctly to give us um, the, the most um, operational systems that we can get to. Um, uh, exhaust fans we've repaired in the last 10 weeks. I want to say somewhere close to 300. Um, and that's all been documented out with our 
um, HVAC providers uh, who I've met with and started to develop um, uh, some sort of capital uh, replacement planning process to look at how uh, the condition of our systems are and how we're maintaining them to make sure that we're maintaining them to manufacturer specifications. And then other components would be the, the, green, the green cleaning program, which is defined um, through the tools for schools program, uh, pest management programs. Pest management program um, is important because when you have uh, pest infiltration, uh, you, sometimes the, the feces and the different things that can uh, be generated by that uh, are, are harmful uh, when, they're, when they're breathed in. So we want to make sure that the, the, the pest programs are, are good and in place and utilizing non-toxic chemicals, uh, which is another thing that can um, get into the, the, the airflow of a building and, and really cause some some issues with with those that have um, asthma and, and breathing issues um, and then testing and tracking radon levels um, this is something that we're doing manually every year um, as we move into better uh, systems for for monitoring and our building maintenance um, this is going to be an, a system that i'm going to look to automate so that we have real-time uh, levels of, of, of uh, radon that we're able to track along with co2 um, to make sure that we're getting the right ventilation into the right areas of a building. Um, so as we move through some of our, our capital uh, planning process in the future, um, we'll, we'll see some of those uh, programs get developed and, and, and implemented. And then uh, the, uh, another part of the, uh, the IAQ that is important is that the monthly, we're gonna have a monthly inspection process. Now the, the tools for, the tools for schools program um, lays out a committee um, that is on the district level um, or at the school level. And this is kind of a, a model of that, um, that's gonna have the facilities leadership, the school principal, along with the building managers that will be doing very specific monthly inspections. And then those inspections will, will come back to me and then they'll be evaluated and um, the inspections, the deficiencies of those inspections will be entered into the work order system under a separate category and tracked so that we can make sure that they're being completed timely. Um, and then in addition to that, all of the program documentation, all of the signature signatory documents, everything that, that is generated is gonna be on the district website um, for everyone to view. Um, we're gonna. We're, I'm gonna be working with the, our new um, director of communications and marketing to um, make some website changes to the operations section that will allow all of this to be uh, readily available and uh, you know displayed in a way that is intuitive, so that it's 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 easy to search and easy to find. Um, and then the, the, the facility management realignment um, that's gonna take place, that has taken place, um, what we've done with the go-to solutions management team is divide them uh, to um, mirror the, uh, the separation of the schools across the assistant superintendents. And um, this was a way that we can uh, give a facilities leader um, and a school, a school principal, a single point of contact so that they, they know I, I, I'm from Hill Central and my contact is John Barbarata. And whenever I have a problem, I go to him. And that kind of spreads the, uh, the load across um, the facility management team so that not any one person is not taking uh, calls or the brunt of of all of the, 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 the service calls and requests coming in. And, and it also provides an additional layer um, of management between the building managers and um, the, the principals so that when there's an issue that's going on within a school, the building managers also have someone that they can go to um, that is devoted to, to their facilities um, versus having that one person at the top. Um, so it, it should uh, 
provide some managerial relief and some um, added um, layers of um, process um, so that we're, we're capturing more of the issues um, than we were in the past. And then just uh, uh, some of the areas that we're working with um, in the HVAC development, um, looking at the filter types, location sizes across the district, there's a, a, a probably a, more than a dozen different types of filters that we, we're dealing with um, uh, across the district, uh, where they are. I think it, a lot of the, the issues that I have found uh, have been related to, we don't know what we have. So we're kind of going through and creating those inventories and creating um, those uh, locations and, and documenting them in a way that's consistent from one change to the next, um, including um, adding the, the photographs and the secondary inspections from facilities leaders, not just from the building managers. And then following the uh, suit with the city with the, the MERV 8 and the MERV 13 filters, um, and then uh, creating a, a, a six month staggered schedule for a replacement of, of filters um, so that we're not doing all the filters all at once. Uh, it's not as labor intensive um, so that that way we have some uh, control, better control over uh, what's getting done and when. Uh, we're in the process of working with the city to create the uh, four custodial engineering positions that this is going to fall on. Um, so we'll be able to better manage um, and make sure that the, the, the filter uh, replacements are, are, are actually getting accomplished. Now, the other piece to this is to make sure that we're not just putting them in and, and going away. We're going to be inspecting them throughout the year to make sure that the six month staggered schedule is appropriate. Uh, we may find that after you know, three months, there may be schools that, that need another filter change. Um, you know, filter, uh, our filter changes are, are not uh, necessarily uh, on a fixed schedule. They're, they're based on the air quality at that time. There may be things happening within the environment around the school that create more debris in the air. There may be, we may have an unusually uh, bad month of pollen and all that stuff's going to get drawn into our, our HVAC systems. So we need to be monitoring um, our current protocols to make sure that we're not in need of more stringent protocols down the road. Uh, and then the replacement of the uh, um, inspections from the facility leaders to include um, phot photographs um, so that we're able to you know, physically ass assess, yes, this is the filter and yes, it is dirty. And, or no, it's not dirty. And you know, the, the, the filters that are installed have, have dates and it has uh, initials on them to show that they were installed on this date and they've been in for this long. I think that's a very, we do that in healthcare all the time. It's a best practice across the country. So that's something that I'm definitely going to bring into the into this uh, group, and they've embraced it fairly well. So I'm I'm, I'm hoping that the, that's something that we're going to do long into the future. And then my last uh, slide it just goes over um, the different uh, inventories that we're creating um, and uh, moving to a more proactive approach across the district um, with how we look at maintenance and. Um, reduce system downtime, I think, is an important piece of, of uh, improving the indoor air quality across the system. And then um, in your packets and uh, um, online, there are, are several documents that go into that we've created through the, uh, the use of the Tools for Schools program and then some things that I've created with the team on, on my own um, that really reflect where we want to be with the program and um, how to improve it and, and gain some visibility and transparency. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. That I think one of the takeaways I really want people 
understand is the um, layers of checks and balances that you've done so that we don't run into the same problems we went we had before with the filters. And at this time, you know, of COVID, we want all the filters working well, you know, um, and keeping the facilities um, safe as far as um, and on the infectious side. So thank you very much. This is, um, I look forward to seeing how this works out. Would you come back in six months and let us know how it worked out? Absolutely. I think, right. um, I think a big piece to, to take away from this too is no system is perfect. And there right. will be things that will be, will be missed. Um, but we're going to make every effort to make sure it doesn't happen. Yes. Thank you so much for all your hard work. I really appreciate it. The district appreciates it, especially since with us going back into the building. So thank you very much. And that concludes my report today. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, Mr. Lamb. So the naming report, you're still on. No report. Teaching and learning, Dr. Joyner. Actually, we have we we have a lot to report, but time is really problematic. So what I'm going to do is just give you a skeleton, and then the, hopefully next meeting we'll have enough time to give a an elaborated teaching and learning report. Um, uh, we have great leadership in that area, and we're trying to overcompensate for what hasn't been done and trying to put teaching and learning at the heart of what we do as a school district. Uh, we should be able to justify everything that we do on the basis of how it benefits children and teachers in schools. And um, all the subject area supervisors have contributed to the development of an instructional framework that is broad enough to cover all of the standards and uh, research-based practices to teaching and learning, but it's also flexible enough for teachers to be creative. Uh, we use the example of the jazz musician. Uh, everybody plays uh, a particular song differently, but you recognize the song. And so i like to thank uh, Mr. Wilcox for showing up at the meeting, as he has shown up at just about every meeting that we've had and and, you saved my meeting. Yeah, and offering, yeah, we need to appreciate that about him. And and offering um, the idea that we hadn't, we may not be doing enough to go back to the audit that was done. I had some issues with the audit, but it does have something in it that's meaningful. And and, and I like to inform Mr. Wilcox that uh, Evie and Dr. Tracy, Tracy have been working on that. Uh, we just need an update. And, um, and I think we need time. We need, we need a little bit more time in these meetings for teaching and learning. And so we had all the subject area people there. Uh, we're trying to uh, create a system with high levels of academic press, where it's very clear what students need to know and be able to do, and also helping parents understand their responsibilities in all of this, as well as teachers and administrators. And it is really, it is really the core of it is language development across the content areas because as you know, language unlocks every content area door. But again, no matter how bright you are, unless you have the social, social and emotional intelligence that goes with it, um, you can render yourself less effective. So uh, we'll, we'll have a more elaborated report um, at the next meeting, but we're basically trying to create a policy that will make it very clear what we expect in various arenas of, of teaching and learning. And we'll, we'll send you, I, I believe uh, uh, the assistant superintendent has sent the board the uh, instructional framework. And that's gonna sort of be our guide. And there's some other things that we're, we're trying to do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Question from Question, we'll move on to the food service task group report. Okay, uh, I'm gonna make my, I'm sorry, madam, I had a Hold question on, related to the teaching and learning committee and that's a suggestion that, if I may, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, the teaching and learning report often falls so late in this meeting that we don't have time to hear about it. Whereas we are a board of education and teaching and learning is slightly important. So. 
um, perhaps we could have that moved up in the agenda mm -hmm. for next meeting so that we could actually get to some of this information that is promised to us uh, that we don't seem to have a lot of time for in our meetings. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make my reports um, short because of time. Um, I'm not gonna report, there's gonna be no report for uh, the equity committee because we've talked, we spent a great deal of time about that and, and my colleagues on the board have certainly picked up the uh, slack and I have the same sentiments that they have. Um, but um, we've talked about that enough, spent a great deal of time on that. And I do think that that, that needs to be prioritized. Um, so my food service committee report is that they closed the, the food, the summer school program down on Friday. And um, they serve as, as, as all the, as that summer report present, was presented, all those students were served food um, and each one of those programs that that those um, that was articulated through the summer program. Um, now the staff is getting ready to open up the uh, the schools for um, the, the school year, and this is this is this is after we've been closed down. So they're getting ready for that. They're looking they're looking to hire and everything as well. We're reviewing policies um, three thousand series. Um, we, 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 one of our priorities is to, to accommodate students with uh, special dieting needs, food allergy, and the whole management plan we're trying to lay out. Um, so we, we will still keep that as a priority. We will be um, meeting next month. The, 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 the details are, are in the minutes that are online. And, um, you know, food service is, is, is very important. It's going to, and we're going to see how this plays itself out as we come back to school and um, as we're under this, you know, this new normal as it relates to school. So that's my report. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Conway. My only question is, um, Ms. Jackson, are you presenting the um, accommodating student with special dietary needs? Food allergy management plan? Yes, I am. And also our food director, Ms. Uh, Karen's is here as well. I apologize. Uh, my dog is uh, going to cut up. I can't keep him quiet at this point in time. I guess it's too late in the evening. So um, you guys will have to just bear with me on that. So I apologize. But um, if we could bring in Ms. Gail. Um, Everybody's dog acts still, up on this meeting. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's time to go to bed. He's I don't have a little saying. dog. He's a big dog. I tried. <laughs> Mr. Sorry, Wilcox, guys. did you have a question? No, this was my question if we were going to okay. have this presentation. Okay. So very quickly, um, as we all know, we had a policy we started uh, working on the um, policy for accommodating students with food uh, allergies. Um, uh, in 2017, the Food Service Task Force has worked on doing some updates. Uh, pretty much just to remind everyone, the, the essence of this policy really is to make sure that we're training all of our staff regarding life-threatening allergies as it relates to uh, students with special dietary needs. Again, also reminding folks what's in the policy really talks a little bit about uh, things that we have to do as a school personnel, inclusive of things like creation of an individual health care plan, uh, making sure that we have an emergency plan, making sure that we have proper signage, so on and so forth. Um, and is Gail on? Because Gail is going to be doing this section. If not, I can continue forward. Yes, I'm on. So this okay, is... Okay, go ahead, Gail. These were some things, key points that we fell out of our management guideline that we were, that we had um, distributed in 2017. And one of the things was that the provides the guidance for practical imp implication for policy. And that's just, it goes for all of the staff, all the school staff. Um, we highlighted the roles and responsibilities for all the stakeholders in there. And that means students, um, parents, school bus drivers, food service staff, paras, teachers, um, lunchroom. And then it outlines a communication plan for those life-threatening allergies. Um, and so in the policy, it says that we're going to come and talk to you every year to make sure that everybody is doing their part of this so that 
our plan is always constantly changing and updating as needed. Next slide. So we created, we decided, we talked with um, Stacy Hutchinson from the Department of Health. He's in charge of the school nurses, along with Monica Lopez and Sue Peters, Tiffany and myself, trying to create more of a district monitoring system to strengthen this policy, because sometimes it seems like it falls on just the school nurse and myself and my staff. So we need help from all of the teachers, the paras, the um, people that work in the cafeteria outside the my food service staff, but the ones that are overseeing the children. Um, we, so we are looking at how we can do that. We're increasing the training across all of the school personnel. Um, and in fact, I met Stacy today. We were both at the fire academy training staff. He was training school nurses and I was training my staff for today. We also have training tomorrow, the next two days. So then we're going to hopefully strengthen the communication across our whole school community about the plan and about our checklist that we also have. Um, district monitoring, we have development of a district food allergy team that we've decided that we will be month by monthly to make sure that all of the parts are being done. We're identification of school-based food allergy representative for each school. One key person that we can contact to bring in to meet the school nurse and myself and have more of a liaison there. Can't always fall on the school nurse. Quarterly meetings are gonna be between the district team and school-based representatives. We think these will help keep our district monitoring the right policy. Implementation of our life-threatening allergy checklist to ensure that that's continuing. Further development of our lunchroom guidelines. We were talking about how do we identify those children as they come through the lunch line. It's very hard if we don't know who they are, if we don't have a picture of them. Um, so we're looking at how can we get pictures for my food service staff or even other staff so that we could quickly look at it and make sure we're, we're identifying the right one. Or some people suggest buttons, some people suggested bracelets. So we're still gonna work on that um, to come up with a better plan. Creation of, um, oh, communication. Tiffany, I think you were gonna do this one. I was just gonna say, you could go, you could do the whole <laughs> PowerPoint if you wanted to Gail, but this is fine. Um, just you as- <laughs> <laughs> just as Gail has mentioned, um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I just wanted to let you know, um, we met with the administrators relative to some of the food allergy um, updates. And also, I think that one of the good things, we met with them on August 18th in their opening meeting. They too felt it was a really good idea for us to have a key person at each of the schools that we would be meeting with um, uh, at least quarterly, so that this way we had better coordination at the school level, so that, it, as uh, Gail mentioned, it didn't just fall on the nurses or the um, or the food service professionals, but that it's a coordinated effort and there's somebody in the building. Um, in your board packets, you will see the life-threatening allergy checklist. That would be the guidance that we'd be using with these um, persons in the building, enough to make sure that again, from the time the student is coming into the building, from the time that the child is going home, that again, people are doing their due diligence, whether it's making sure that we're informing substitutes, whether we have proper signage. Um, Gail has already worked on some signage that she's been uh, piloting in a, a particular school as well. Um, the other thing that we talked about was really looking at some uh, guidance document. Um, the nursing department, really what we talked about is that the guidance document, the implementation plan, you guys have seen it, is, is somewhat lengthy, it's big, but really scaffolding that information so that it's user-friendly for parents so that they can easily search it on the website. Um, and also that moving forward, we would put it into the um, board packets. Um, another thing that the nursing department is working on with the IT department is really looking at the key alerts um, within our student information systems. And then uh, the other thing offered even from our nursing supervisory staff is really one of the things that they want to make sure that they're doing even within their training is to make sure that their nursing staff again um, are going over process and procedures and really the ways by which they're communicating with everyone within the school community. Um, and again, uh, one thing that um, Gail has mentioned, it's in progress, is really looking at the creation of a website portal that highlights food ingredients. Am I saying that right, Gail? Right, and highlights the food ingredients. Um, professional development as we've met, uh, one of the things that we talked about, again, to really help tighten up any um, gaps that exist, and we've never done this in the district before, is to really have joint professional development between nursing and food service staff 
um, in addition to having the um, school-based representative. Again, also mentioned the quarterly training for the food allergy process, um, food allergy representative. We talked about the de development of training and curriculum for parents and students, for students to be able to understand their own allergies and really being able to advocate. We know that even for some of our younger students, um, you know, it may be a little bit different, but making sure that we're educating our, our parents and our teachers as well. And then really, um, scaffolding the information that we have by way of roles and, and responsibilities. If you remember that food allergy management plan, it has roles and responsibilities for every stakeholder. But one of the things that we talked about is really having those, um, that information broken down into smaller increments just to make it real, really user-friendly for everyone who really is going to um, impact um, the student who has accommodations based on a food allergy. And our next, okay, and our next steps, we're going to just working on a, a better way to identify the children as they come through the lunchroom. That's really key. Um, and so because there again, staff changes, people, and we're using substitutes. How do we make sure that that we know John Smith is John Smith and what which grade he's coming through? What is his allergies? And, you know, that's a huge thing. How, because as a kitchen, we're trying to get them through, right? Because that's the other thing we have very short time to get the, the students through the lunch line. And how do we correctly do that? So we're looking at other ways that we can come up with a plan together with the school nurses and with the leadership at the schools on what's the best procedure for that. Um, and then we're also looking at a, a feedback document to implement for the parents, whether it be a survey or that, how do they would like us to recognize or not recognize their students when they come through the school lunch line? One, two different things. One of the things that we did hear from parents as we first started doing this, um, really looking at those personal identifiers, there were some parents who were very much in agreement with that and making sure that the students are identified as they're going through the lunch line. And then there were some other uh, parents where we got some feedback that they did not want their children to be made to feel um, different than others. So really making sure that we're talking with our parents. And the other thing that we talked about, we don't have this yet, but really looking at some sort of feedback form so that we really can get some feedback from our parents about how we're implementing accommodations based off of a student's um, food allergy. We want to make sure that we have feedback so that as we're doing the annual review, that could be one of the drivers of um, any changes that needed to be made. And I think with that, if there's any questions. Oops, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, sorry, Yesenia, you, you do this portion. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Wilcox and then Dr. Jackson. <laughs> uh, thank you. I just have um, a question or two and a comment. Um, uh, the, the, you mentioned in the communication plan that the creation of the parent guardian guidance documents uh, and that the handbook is, I mean, that, that this information is going to go on the website, which is something that the, our policy requires that the management plan goes up on the website. Do you know when that's going to be completed? Is that going to be um, in the next week, two weeks, four weeks? I would, say, I would say in the next two weeks because we're planning on a meeting on September 3rd, I believe it was, is our first meeting um, as a district team just to coordinate and make sure that whatever it is that's going on the website, that we actually have those pieces together. So I would say definitely within the next couple of weeks. All right, thank you. And I guess uh, I just have a, a comment or two and that is that um, I just wanna thank everyone for their work on this. Uh, especially I also wanna thank um, one of our parent advocates, citywide parent team president, uh, Ms. Najije Ife Waters, who's been a tireless uh, advocate on this issue for many years, five, six, six years at least. And so I'm, I'm glad to see that there's progress on this. I wanna thank Mr. Conaway for keeping this on the agenda at Food Service and um, I, been part of some of these meetings. Um, and I, I do think that there's some substantial changes that are happening. The new uh, director of the public health nurses seems to be very sharp on this. And uh, in the meeting I was in, had a lot of great ideas from moving this forward. So uh, it's, it's a key issue. And uh, I'm hoping we can complete this process of getting the information out there and look forward to the updates on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Dr. Jackson? Um, yeah, I love this, guys. Um, but what one thing that I've, I've been stressing in, about from the beginning of this is the chain of command and the identification. So 
when the kid gets on the bus from the first time we get them either on the bus or dropped off at the door, they should be identified from that moment. Whether you use, you know, I don't know, a lanyard, a bra- uh, one of those, you know, those bracelets. I don't know what you're going to choose, but it's really, really important. It's, and I, I just remember, um, it might've been two years ago, Matt might remember this, where we had a kid with um, food allergies who got his allergen twice within like a month. And um, luckily he didn't ingest it, but the problem was that he wasn't identifiable. So he got what everybody else got. So it's really important to make these kids identifiable, but not like, you know, sticking out like sore thumbs. So I, I, I look forward to that. And that's one of the most important tasks you have. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Dr. Joyner? I want to echo what Dr. Jackson said because I, I know of, of children who have died as a result of not being identified. And uh, while, while kids might see it as a stigma, it's really a lifesaver. And, and maybe that should be a part of the policy. We, we need to talk to parents about uh, being able to identify the kids. So it's for, fairly easy. If you see a kid, if you see a kid in a certain state, you could see, look on his arm or around his neck and see that, that he is this or that. Um, I, I, as, a, as a historian, I don't want anybody to ever forget the role that Daisy Gonzalez played in this. Uh, Ife Waters played a, a, a big role. Uh, Daisy was Ife's mentor in a sense. And I can remember being out in the rain uh, with the three of them uh, when we were going to a meeting about, about some of this. So don't ever forget Daisy Gonzalez, uh, as well as any other person in this city who has been the foundation for a lot of the good that we do. That, that's all I want to say about that. And thank everybody for, Tiffany, you do a phenomenal job and so does our director of food services. Uh, we do have some phenomenal people working in the school district. Also, Executive Session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 12006B and 1210B10 regarding discussion of written communications privileged by the attorney-client relationship regarding FOIA. Um, and that would include Attorney Alexiades and Dr. Tracy. Um, Ms. Hannon's email to be linked to the Executive Session. So you have to leave here and join the Executive Session through that link. You need a motion? There is, yeah, is that, that was the motion. Is there a second? Second. Well, they're leaving. <laughs> second. Thank you, Dr. Joyner. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go up going into executive session. Who's left? <laughs> Don't you have to have Mr. a vote? Mr. Wilcox, we are yes. having a vote. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Goldson? Yes. Mr. Conaway? Yes. Um, and that 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 was sent out by Ms. Hanna. Ms. Hannah's, yep. 607 okay, PM. 603. Say that again? Or, it was at 603 or 607, somewhere in that in that range. Okay, thank you. Dr. Joyner? Yes. And I am a yes. Thank goodness we had enough to um I'm a yes to this. Oh, Chelsea. Mayor Elliker. Hi. Yes, hi. <laughs> Yes. Okay. We'll see you on the other side.
Waiting on Dr. Joyner and Mr. Conway. I'll, I'll wait another 30 seconds and then we'll start. I was struggling with the links. <laughs> There he is. Okay, so we're all back. Um, we are out of executive session and in regular session, um, no votes um, were taken in executive session. Um, and so I think with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I moved. Second. Mayor Elliker? Yes. Dr. Joyner? Yes. Dr. Jackson uh, left the meeting. Uh, Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Goldson? Yes. Mr. Conaway? Yes. And I am a yes. <laughs>